ultimately it was um, the powers to issue energy company uh, warrants of entry uh, that triggered my resignation because I was very concerned that not enough was being done to divert people uh, out of the criminal justice system uh, as a consequence of the rising cost of living. Okay. And that's the, the topic of our uh, inquiry today, uh, is the, both the process for the issue of the warrants and then what happens thereafter with the installation uh, of, of metres. Um, how many cases of that kind do you think you dealt with during, during your time as a magistrate? So, by the very nature of what we're going to discuss, it was, it was more common um, uh, in the early years and uh, after the changes that we'll come on to in, in 2019, much less common. So, um, uh, in the early years, I would have dealt with these cases quite regularly. Um, I sat between sort of 15 and 20 days a year and these cases would have come up quite regularly. Um, uh, towards the end, uh, much less uh, frequently. But, um, uh, yes, we'll, we'll come on to talk about the nature of that. Okay. Well, initially, if we can go back to your, your first appointment, when you were dealing with your regular, fa fairly regularly, um, probably pre-2019, I think we'll find out is, is the relevant date. Um, can you just outline for us what was the process that you typically have uh, with, with a list that involved uh, applications yes. for warrants? So as, as the committee are probably aware, the, the, the threshold for issuing a warrant is actually really very uh, low. There has to be some money owed, an amount big or small, there's, there, there's, there's no minimum. There has to have been a demand uh, made to pay in full within 28 days, um, or the option to pay a deposit should not have been taken up. Um, the amount owed has to be not in dispute, um, and a, sort of a human rights notice, that is a notice that you are uh, entitled to come to uh, a court and challenge the warrant should have been issued. Um, and... Uh, what we would do is a warrant officer would come to court uh, in person. Um, in, we would put them on oath uh, in, the, in, the, in the witness box, and we would do this fairly frequently. We'd be dealing with a few warrants uh, at a time. Um, the proceedings, as far as the occupant was concerned, would be taking place in a known location at a known date and time, um, so they could contest the, the application if they wished to. Um, I think in six years as a magistrate, I never actually took part in a single contested hearing. What was much more common was that uh, the, the occupant would turn up at court, the warrant officer would disappear into the lobby, uh, there'd be some discussion and they'd come back and then withdraw the warrant rather than, paid, through, basically, yeah, rather than go to a contested hearing. Um, <laughs> And uh, yes, so we would have the warrants in front of us. Uh, we had a, a, a straightforward checklist that we would go through, um, basic details, address, purpose of warrant, um, the amount outstanding, whether the occupant was known, and if the occupant wasn't known, um, what steps had been taken to identify them or indeed to identify if the property was occupied uh, at all. Yeah. Vulnerabilities, were there young children present, very elderly present, um, people with disabilities, and all of those um, uh, checks are allowed for under the law. What we would then do is we would... Uh, based on the information given to us by the warrant officer uh, or information in the warrant application itself, we may then go on um, and to ask questions such as how many attempts there had been to uh, uh, contact uh, the, the occupant, um, the recency of the last visit, the amount owed, uh, whether they'd been offered a payment plan, uh, what other efforts had been made to collect the amount. And the, uh, one of the questions on vulnerability was whether people, whether the occupant might be experiencing um, uh, severe financial insecurity. So as a consequence of that, sometimes the warrant officer would go back and would have to check or we would um, reject the warrant. But if a warrant was granted, a physical piece of paper would be passed down the bench. I would sign some of them uh, as a magistrate um, or, the or the application would be declined. The, the foundation legislation is uh, about 1954 um, act, isn't it? Um, and that gives... It's been suggested to us, precious little discretion once, in effect, the debt is proved uh, and the, the statutory requirements for the issuance of the warrant are proved, uh, that's really it. You're absolutely, so, and one of the things that I think it is important for the committee to know, um, because uh, in various sort of public defences of this from the Magistrates Association and others, people have been saying, look, magistrates have to apply the law. There was no change in the law. There was a very substantial change in how the courts operated, yes. what the outcomes were, and the number of bailiffs yeah. knocking on people's doors. And that, that, that I want to come to, because when we talk about a warrant officer again, for example, some people might think that's an officer of the court or a police officer. This is a representative uh, of the, um, energy company. The, the energy company or the agents Indeed. acting to collect the debt for them, effectively. Um, you, you referred to the, to the checklist that you used to have, uh, and we've got a, a specimen in front of us mm. uh, here. And, as you say, that sets out the name of the company, the name of the, the applicant. Um, I think it means of recording any respondents who did attend, virtually mm -hmm. never, um, uh, and a uh, number of applications opposed. Uh, 
But in particular, there's this passage in the checklist. Does this uh, tally with your recollection? In relation to each application, is the information in writing? Yes, no. If no, stop. Don't issue the warrant. Pretty obvious. Um, identification, warrant card produced. Yes, no. If no, stop. Ask them to, to leave and come back when they've got identification. Obviously right. And then you're asked to check, does the, the application clearly state the enactment from which it's based, the address, as you say, the purpose of the application, uh, and the amount uh, outstanding? Uh, and uh, if uh, any of that's missing, the, you, you'd expect those to be fully enumerated. Otherwise, if they were missing, it would be a ground for uh, not issuing the warrant, wouldn't it? That's right. And, and, and what you effectively have, although this doesn't cover the, the, the full extent of the, the questions we would often ask, is yeah. there is a sense here that this is a flowchart, that you are going yes. through a process and applying some judicial discretion, yeah. uh, whereas under the current process there is an uh, enormous presumption uh, that the warrant would be granted. Yeah. And I, I understand that. So can you just help me about this? Uh, Pre-2019... Did you have any guidance as to the application uh, of the, the Human Rights Act process? In other words, um, the, the, the right uh, that uh, the respondents to the warrant, the occupiers of the premises, would have in relation to, let's say, Article 6, right to a fair trial, uh, or Article 8, their right to family life, which could be affected by the disconnection uh, of their electricity or gas. I'm aware that uh, there were, for example, Judicial College training courses uh, that were optional. There were some parts of the country that had uh, best practice checklists and Q&As that went beyond what we've discussed um, today. Uh, I myself, no, was not given any grounding in uh, the human rights legislation when processing these warrants. Um, I want to be clear that uh, I have nothing but praise for HMCTS's legal advisers who steer magistrates through these processes in court, and the likelihood is that uh, I would have been advised, as with the, the entire bench, as to what we needed to be satisfied of uh, in that moment. Okay. Tell me what then changed in 2019. Um, so I, I think if I may, Mr Chairman, it, it's important to just, as part of the timeline, to just stress that in, in, in 2017, yeah. uh, Ofgem published some uh, statutory consultation out mm -hmm. outcomes in which they said um, warrants were being used too readily, there were less invasive alternatives, um, they were concerned about failures to identify vulnerable customers, that some vulnerable customers were going through traumatic experiences and some companies were applying excessively high charges. I think it's important to understand that because in 2019, Despite all of those concerns, uh, the process was changed such that the field was tilted even further in favour of the energy companies. So uh, we were required to take on as magistrates an almost entirely uh, performative and uncritical role uh, applying and approving these warrant applications uh, in bulk, much less judicial discretion in, in the current process. So it's a bulk process. Rather than having individual warrants in front of us, there'd be a spreadsheet. Um, that spreadsheet would uh, contain many more applications in a list. Um, I now know, I didn't know at the time, um, that some of the courthouses are, are dealing with up to 1,000 per list. It was my experience that I was sort of dealing with between 50 and 100. Um, the occupants don't know when, where, what time uh, the application is being dealt with. Um, and there is much, much less information on the spreadsheet. So uh, partial address, name if available, my recollection is the amount was on there, although I've seen subsequent guidance that suggests it's not always the, the case. Um, <coughs> the warrant officer would then come on the phone, no longer physically required to, to come to court. court. Um, they would come on oath. They would read a, a fairly template declaration um, to say that they'd done everything that they needed to do. And they would then notify us if they were withdrawing an application. So um, because the magistrates had so much less information before them, there was basically no there were no grounds on which we could then question a warrant, and so you're entirely reliant on the warrant officer to withdraw applications. Right. Um, and then the, the usual process, the legal advisor would steer you through, uh, the presiding justice would check that their wingers were happy, um, and uh, once they were happy, the, the warrants would be signed electronically. Okay. Ms Eagle. Thank you. Um, once the process had changed in the way in which you've just described, did you receive then any further guidance on how to deal with warrant applications, or did you just feel like you were administering a process? So the, uh, the change was certainly communicated by email, but as is often the case in, in the courts, your legal advisor will brief you moments before you enter the court, and again in open court, as to what you need to be satisfied of, and, and that would have been the, the, the norm. In the moment, the legal advisor would have been taking us through step by step what we needed to be satisfied of. 
But if you, if you, as a magistrate, had concerns about an application for a warrant or just had a general concern that you were being asked suddenly to okay a number that you couldn't satisfy yourself about in the way in which you had previously, could you ask for any more information about an individual applicant? Could you no pluck one out of the list and say, Mr. Bloggs, what's, what, tell me about this, this application? It, uh, had I, uh, as a winger, asked my uh, presiding justice to do that, my presiding justice would have asked me to justify the grounds on which I was doing that. Um, and if I had sort of made up a requirement that I wanted to sample the list on that basis, I think that would have been uh, treated as irregular and, and wouldn't have been allowed to go ahead. So no, I, I wouldn't have been able to, to pick any address out. Am I right in thinking that the, um, the guidance issued at the same time as the bulk upload procedure was introduced from the National Leadership Magistrate justified these changes in the sense that advice to justices hadn't kept up with the way in which utility companies operate and the rationale appeared to be that given that um, the utility companies weren't enforcing entry to disconnect that therefore the previous way of doing things was disproportionate. Is, is, was that the rationale for this change in guidance? That is a retrofitted rationale, uh, I would say. So the, the guidance that you're referring to um, is an articulation of uh, the, the process that was issued just this year. So although the process changed in 2019, that guidance came out uh, uh, just earlier this year. And, you, and you're absolutely right. And, and in that guidance, it makes, for example, no reference whatever to the 500 to 600,000 people a year who self-disconnect. No reference at all. I was going to make the point, do you understand, what is the philosophical difference between being disconnected and not having enough money to put in the meter to enable you to have electricity or gas? What is the actual difference in practice? That's it. So uh, as far as the guidance issued is concerned, as far as the new process is concerned, uh, the whole premise of this is that the installation of a prepayment meter is somehow trivial when compared to disconnection. But, but in order to come to that point, you do have to be willfully blind to the information that is known, that is published by Ofgem, that, as I say, up to 600,000 self-disconnect, lack of money a key reason, and that around half had experienced a negative impact on health or mental health as a, as a consequence. None of that is reflected in the guidance to the courts. Did it concern you that um, the warrant officer, who you're now not seeing in front of you, which, which is different to seeing them in front of you, yeah. um, maybe in your case you said, 50 to 100 cases at a time. Um, how could you satisfy yourself? Obviously, they've taken an oath, but you have no way of checking on the process that you've set out there that that person has carefully checked through each case to make the assertion that he can't go behind the oath, really, can you? No, you have, you have, there are, there's no basis to, uh, to question further. And you see that um, in the, the number of applicants, uh, number of one applications rejected. So uh, on the MOJ's numbers in 2019, uh, 1,824 applications were rejected. In 2020, it drops to 43. Mm -hmm. And it stays in double digits despite the applications then soaring in number. Now, Lord Justice Edis said in his statement on the 6th of February when he suspended any further consideration of these warrants, that magistrates relied on the assurances made by all applicants on oath that the supplier and their agents have complied with the standards set by Ofgem. And he went on to say that Ofgem themselves have now re reiterated concerns, and that was his rationale <coughs> for um, suspending the, um, the, 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 the operation of the, the, these yeah. warrants or any more warrants being applied for. So what was your understanding uh, before then, when you were on the bench, of course, of the nature of the assurances made by all applicants for warrants on oath? Um, so the applicants, by the point that they came on, on the telephone, they would be uh, declaring that they were a fit and proper person appointed by the energy company or on, on behalf, um, that the company was compliant with the supply licence, and it's really that part that covers, for example, checking whether or not customers are, are, are vulnerable, um, that entry was reasonably required under the legislation, that that very low threshold that they had to, to hit had been met, um, and that the sums weren't being contested um, and that some efforts had been made to engage with the customer. Was there any consideration about the vulnerability of the, of the, um, of the people who were, who, who, who were, whose these warrants were being 
uh, the, signed up again. The, the, under the old process, that there may have been sort of clues, if you like, in individual applications. There may have been information on the applications, or to some degree you might have been able to apply local knowledge um, uh, in order to, to raise those questions. Um, uh, so, you know, an, an address might be, you know, associated with particularly vulnerable people. But the, um, uh, under the, 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 the bulk process, no, you would be entirely reliant on the warrant officer to volunteer that information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Turner. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. So I think I'm right in saying between July 2021 and December 2022, magistrates granted a staggering, I think, a staggering 536,139 of these warrants and refused, I think, just 75. Why do you think that is? Um, I think... If I may, if you indulge me for just a, a moment, I think the answer to that is much more clearly articulated in, in the guidance that has been referred to than, 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 than I could tell you myself. Um, so uh, the, the guidance that was issued took the form of a Q&A. Um, and if I may, I'll, I'll just quickly rattle through some. Um, we always used to require them, the energy companies, to prove more things, for example, the date of last visit. There's no requirement in the legislation for any personal visit at all. Can the justice refuse to issue a warrant if the sum is less than 100 or 200 pounds? If the applicant proves their grounds on oath, normally you should grant the order as it would be irrational not to. Um, do we need to know the sum demanded in, a, in each case? The amount is not a relevant consideration. Um, when it came to the sending of human rights letters, once the notice has been sent and no reply received, the court can be satisfied that it is not opposed. Now, in all sorts of comparable procedures, there would be uh, some recourse for somebody to say, I did not get that letter, but not here. Um, I believe the fees companies charge to fit a prepayment meter are too high. Can I refuse to issue a warrant on these grounds? In general, no. What do we do if someone turns up for the telephone hearing? That is a vanishingly remote possibility, as occupiers are not told the date or location and the hearings are not in public. If by some freak chance somebody did demand admittance, the justice could either get on with the case in private uh, or put it off. So you know, there should be alarm bells ringing about that. I promise I'm coming to an end very quickly. How do you check for conflict of interest? Uh, strictly speaking, there probably isn't a need to be concerned about this. Um, it could be embarrassing for a magistrate to find that they had issued a warrant against their cousin, fellow worker, sworn enemy, etc., uh, so a search can be made on the names. Uh, is there an appeal? Not strictly speaking. What if the customer doesn't attend the contested hearing? Um, by, not, by their absence, it is clear they are not contesting it. And again, in comparable procedures, we simply would not take that as read. This is a reflection of a very strong presumption that magistrates were simply expected to perform a role really no more sophisticated than an algorithm. Has a properly constituted application been put in front of me? If yes, approve. Incredibly helpful. I suppose you've answered my next question, which is why, in your experience, you think so few of these applications are actually contested. Well, I think the answer to that is known to the court. I think the answer lies in um, a, a document that we're all issued with called the Equal Treatment Bench Book, um, and uh, it refers, for example, for socially excluded people. It says there is a fear factor for many. They are used to having important decisions about their lives made by others. A failure to attend a hearing, for example, may be due to a, cha a chaotic lifestyle. They may lack what judges presume to be a natural wish to come along and put one's case. It cannot be assumed that the individual defendant is able, a defendant in this context, is able to understand legal documents. Problems of understanding may not be confined to the written word. The answers to why there are so few contested applications are absolutely known to the court, but are completely thrown out in the guidance, totally ignored. Thank you. So you decided to go public once you'd resigned from the magistrate. Whilst you were serving as a magistrate, did you <coughs> raise your concerns with the court clerks, legal advisers, or indeed with senior members of the judiciary, the district judge? Yes, yeah, so as I, said, I, the, um, as I said at the outset of my evidence, there were a number of interconnected matters. Um, and so, um, uh, yes, I, for example, 
um, uh, raise concerns uh, about changes to victim surcharges, which, which are affecting this group of people, the most vulnerable in society, in exactly the same way. Um, I wrote to, um, I won't personalise it, I wrote to a member of the magistrate's leadership uh, executive around that. Well, first of all, I raised it with my local elected bench chair, yep. um, who was very diligent, um, uh, listened very closely, but, but that role is simply not empowered to um, affect change at speed in, in these kinds of things. But I wrote to the magistrate's leadership executive um, uh, about, um, uh, it was actually about um, victim surcharges, but the, the reply that I got back was, our judicial oath requires us to apply the law, whatever our personal views might be, and if a judicial office holder finds they cannot do that, then resigning is the appropriate course. Now, there are two parts to that. The oath requires us to apply the law, which of course is absolutely true as a magistrate, I believe, in the, in, 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 in the rule of law, um, but actually the oath is to do right to all manner of people after the law, and it's within those words, to do right to all manner of people, that I think that judicial discretion uh, lies. And again, I emphasise there was no change in the law. There was a huge change in how magistrates applied the law. Um, but also, I think it's an indication that you kind of you raise these matters constructively, politely, in an evidence-based way, and the response is, well, you can always resign. What do you think to that response, and did you change uh, it, the poor response? Ultimately, I took its advice. That, 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 that advice was given to me in, in, in June, and, and I resigned in August. So based on your experience, who's responsible for identifying and resolving problems <coughs> with our process operates within the magistrate's court, would you say? The, the normal people that a, 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 a magistrate would reach to would be your bench chair, um, who is represented on um, uh, a number of bodies, um, or, you're absolutely right, for, for some of the roles that are actually being abolished around deputy justices, clerks, and so on, um, uh, you might talk to. There's also, if, if you'll forgive me, there's also the, the, the Magistrates Association, and I should acknowledge that I was never a member of the Magistrates Association. It has always seemed to me to be a, uh, a deeply conflicted and, and, and rather compromised organisation. I think we need to go into that. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Just, just getting um, <coughs> back to some of the, the factual position, Mr. Cantrell Fenwick. Um, did you notice any change uh, in the number of applications refused uh, before and after the change in process in 2019? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, under the old process, I, I, I would personally have been involved in rejecting some applications, and under the new one, not at all. Yeah. We've got some statistics which seem to suggest in 2019 across the country refused 1,824 out of 2,278,000-odd. Um, by 2022, it's 56 refused. Uh, it's a 98% drop in one year. Yes, OK. Uh, and then just in terms of the chronology uh, of the matter, the bulk upload process is introduced, I think that's about September yep. 2019, and the telephone process comes in uh, together uh, with that. Um, at that stage... There's no additional guidance as to how you deal with those matters coming from any central body. Not that I recall. They're, they're, they're almost certainly, as with, with any significant change like that, there would have been an email. Um, yeah. uh, but uh, as is usually the case with a procedural change in court, you would expect to be briefed on it moments before entering the court. Indeed, and, and the legal advisor would yeah, do that. Absolutely. And, and as you say, repeated in open court. Exactly so. Because of the open, open nature of justice, have you? Although, yes, uh, uh, but of course, bearing in mind that this actual procedure happens not in open it happens in court but not in open court yeah, indeed, it's yeah, not open to the public yeah. effectively nobody's going to be there indeed but it's just stated for the record in yeah. effect isn't it having check yeah. just on that yeah, so yeah 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 means, mr point. yeah bell means mr labor and then i'll bring mr david just just um mr cantrell finnick on a point of clarification i mean the, the statistics are absolutely baffling you know 2019 as the chairs just mentioned uh, refused 1,824 total to 78966. And then basically it gets worse to now in 2022. Uh, 56 refused and the total um, that's been accepted is 367,140. You see it that it's not a change in the legislation. And, and by the way, I think your presentation has been, been fine. Uh, it's not a change in legislation. So it's a change in advice. It's a change in advice that magistrates would get. The question, just for a point of clarification, who has got the power to change that advice and what do you believe the, the reason was behind changing that advice that have made the huge difference in, in um, the figures which we've just explained? 
Yes, and so and, and I should say, you know, as, as, a, as a sort of lowly winger, um, the the upper echelons of of the judiciary and, and so on would, would not have been immensely clear to me. But I, the my best guess, my starting point would be the magistrates liaison group, which is the group where the senior judiciary and senior representatives of the magistracy meet to deal with matters of policy and implementation. I suspect that is probably where this um, uh, uh, originated from. Um, as to the reasons why. Again, uh, I can't speak to that in an evidence-based way, but my strong suspicion is this was uh, 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 an innovation to deal with a rising number of applications. That threshold to make a valid application is so low that the volume was just going up and up and up. And my strong suspicion is there were then conversations around, right, how do we balance the interests of an efficient process in the court with an efficient process uh, for the uh, energy companies? And... Uh, Somewhere in that, the interests of the person, the occupier, got lost. And somewhere in that, there was a presumption built in that the energy companies themselves could sufficiently balance the interests of the occupier and their own commercial interests, that they would be the people to exercise restraint on whether or not uh, to put a warrant application in in the first place. And I think ultimately that, that expectation has been shown to be quite naive. Thanks. Ms. Davy. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Hi, Robin. Robin, you mentioned victims' surcharge, and from what I understood from what you said, is you've indicated that this could vary. Could you just say a little bit more about that and how much that that surcharge was or is? I don't think a victim surcharge would no, apply to this, though. No, that's right. So just to be clear, yeah. um, uh, in the course of 2022, there were a number of areas where I was concerned about, if you like, the most vulnerable, the poorest people in society, and the victim surcharges were a tangential um, uh, but, but connected uh, area, so, so not directly related to this. Different issue of concern. Because there's no victim in this case, there couldn't be a surcharge. Indeed. So it wouldn't well, be. you could but, debate whether or not there's a victim in this. Not, not in the terms of the legislation. Indeed. So he had a number of concerns, and that was another one of them. Um, so just then to, to conclude, we've got the chronology of the change to the bulk upload process uh, in about September of 2019. Uh, you've indicated that um, through the court's processes you were revised of that. Um, what we then know is that in December of 2022, um, a journalist, um, Mr Dean Kirby of the I, uh, ran a number of uh, articles um, highlighting uh, what perceived to be potential injustices with this procedure, and that attracted a degree of publicity. And then I think you've referred to the um, communication from the National Leadership Mem Magistrate, Mr Webster. Mm. Um, that's in the form of a short preamble. We have it, and we'll make arrangements for it to be published um, uh, in the annex to our, our, our record of the proceedings. Uh, we refer to certain passages. In fairness, it goes in our printout over a number of pages. Indeed. And it takes the form of utility warrant, frequently asked questions. And you've... Uh, quoted certain extracts uh, from that. That, I think, was issued in January of 2023. That's my understanding, of course, by which point I had left as a magistrate. Yeah. Uh, but the logic of that, there has to be that that uh, guidance from the National Leadership Magistrate is, in fact, a response to the media coverage that had been generated, for the sound of it, uh, earlier that year. I believe it says that yeah. explicitly. In 10 end of 2022. Yeah. 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 OK. Thank you very much. And does anybody else have any questions? Mr Cantrell. If, if you permit me, Chair, may I just very quickly, I'm aware you're, you're tight on time, just to, to highlight that obviously uh, nobody in this process has yet accepted wrongdoing at all. The, the Ministry of Justice said that people can always contest these warrants. We've discussed that. Uh, uh, the senior judiciary said it was reasonable to rely on the energy companies uh, for assurances. HMCTS has been mute. The magistrate's leadership executive has been mute. And the MA, we've discussed, say magistrates did nothing wrong. And I think it's just worth highlighting to you that nobody in this process has yet accepted that what happened was wrong, which poses a very real danger that when the media attention moves on and the parliamentary attention must inevitably move on, that this snaps back to the way it was before, which would be a tremendous injustice. I mean, uh, Lord Justice Edith, but probably perfectly reasonably, from a judicial point of view, says we rel relied upon assurances. Uh, I suppose the question mark, which we'll come on to later, is the reliability of assurances, isn't it? Which we can't help with in, the, in this panel. Mr uh, Cantrell, very grateful to you for your time and for your evidence. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Uh, and if we can now shortly uh, have a quick suspension whilst we move around to the next panel of witnesses. So thank you for coming to help us today. Um, if you could just introduce yourselves and your organisation for the record. Thank you, Chair. My name is Debbie Nolan. I'm the Managing Director of Avato Financial Solutions. 
Mr Johnson. Les Johnson, Chief Executive of Richmond's. Yeah, OK. Now, uh, we've got some written briefing on, the, the, your, on your two uh, companies, but just for the record again, and for those who may be watching, uh, let's start with you, Ms Nolan. Um, can you just explain the, the nature of your business and what you do for energy suppliers? We are, um, we are a debt collection business. Um, we undertake regulated activities supervised by the, the FCA, mm. uh, as well as non-FCA regulated services. Um, we're members of the Credit Services Association and also active members of the Chartered Institute of Credit Management. Thank you. Uh, Mr Johnson? We're a debt collection agency, work um, uniquely for the energy companies. We're a member of the CSA. Um, I'm sorry to spell out the initials for those of us who don't know. Credit Services Agency. Thank you. Um, we comply with their code of conduct and code of practice. Okay. <coughs> uh, Ms Nolan, uh, Avalto started doing this type of work, I'm told, in about 2020. Is that right? No, we've been um, undertaking um, these kind of activities uh, since around 2013. Right. So we started working for British Gas specifically in 2013. I see. So you've been doing work in the field, but then specifically um, for British Gas Centric, as it was called at one point, in, in 2020. How was it that you came to start doing that uh, quite high volume of work for, for British Gas? So we have been working with British Gas since 2013 on a number of different activities for debt collection. Mm. Um, we started a field activity for them around 2017-2018. Um, in 2019, uh, we were part of a, a, a formal process to, uh, to, for, the, for British Gas to outsource all of their, uh, their live management work. So, um, so we took over that contract at the beginning of January 2020. You bid for the contract we and you were successful when yes, it comes down right. to. That's right. And as part of that outsource arrangement, um, 100 or so of the British Gas um, field agents moved into, um, into our environment. <coughs> I understand. Uh, and uh, do you do work for any other energy companies? Yes. Uh, which, which of those? So we also um, undertake work for, um, for OVO, for um, EDF, for E.ON, uh, for Scottish Power. Are there significant differences, um, particularly perhaps leaving aside Scottish Power because the legislation may be different, but are there significant differences in the nature of your contractual arrangements with those other companies? Not, not significant differences in terms of the process. The arrangement with British Gas is very different because it's a full outsource of, of the, of yes, the full process. So the, um, the other organisations, we provide certain elements of the service. Um, there are variations, small variations in the, the, the types of things that we do, but it's predominantly it's the same. If it gets to the stage uh, that uh, uh, an account has got to the position of there being an application for a warrant, the process will be pretty much the same. It, it, it's, it's very similar, yes. Uh, um, each one of those organisations has a different process for checking at every stage whether or not it's appropriate to, to move to a warrant. OK, thanks, that, thanks for that. We may explore that in a moment. Um, uh, and then, Mr Johnson, um, uh, uh, am I right in saying that Richmond's actually carry out some work on behalf of Avato? That is correct. And, and how does that come about? Um, as you've been informed, Ivato tendered for the British Gas contract, so did Richburns. We were not successful. Um, we subcontract visits, not warrants, from Ivato. So we do pre-warrant visits on behalf of Ivato, on behalf of British Gas, but not warrants. Okay. And then you would feed that information back to Ivato? Yes, that's, that uh, is correct. And I assume, Ms Lonan, that will be part of the material you would need to assure the court of in relation to the warrants, is that right? So once a visit has been completed, um, uh, we collect uh, information from that visit, we send that back to the energy providers, and then they use that inf information in their decision process at the next stage. I see, okay. Uh, and uh, finally, Mr Johnson, are there any other energy suppliers that you subcontract for? Yes, yeah, similarly, a number, Scottish Power, Eon, but Utilita, etc. But it's visits again, rather than the actual No, warrants. we do carry out warrants on behalf of oh. some of them. So which companies do you actually make the applications for warrants for? Um, Scottish Power, E.ON, N-Power. Okay. Uh, anything different in broad, in general terms as to the practice? Generally with... similar. The, they're very much the same process that we have to abide by. Okay, fair enough. You all use what's now called the bulk, the bulk upload process. Since uh, oh. August 2019, I believe. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, Ms Davey. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're interested in... I'm interested very much in the contracts you have with the energy suppliers and how that's structured. Um, and obviously there's that interrelationship working between the, yourselves as well. Um, how are you paid for the services that you are contracted to provide by the energy suppliers? And for instance, are you paid for each warrant secured and for each payment meter you install? 
So I wonder if we could start with you, um, Debbie Nolan. So, so we, we don't install the prepayment meters, the energy provider does. We arrange for the warrant application um, at, at that stage in the process. Um, at, the, the, at that visit, our agent will have the warrant and they are accompanied by an, an, um, an engineer from the electricity or the, sorry, from the energy provider um, and a locksmith that the energy provider has contracted as with as well. Right, and are you paid for each warrant that... So it, the, the commercials vary from client to client um, and tend to be focused on the activity that we've undertaken. Um, for British Gas, it's very different because we have an outsource arrangement. They were actually our first organisation that worked with us to create a commercial structure that was focused on the amount of time that it took to, to, um, to, to undertake a visit. So the, um, there is no incentivisation at all for us to drive a certain outcome. It, it, we spend as long as we need at the visit to undertake the review that needs to be done. How is that contract structured then? Is, let's say for British Gas then, is it structured for each visit that you do? It's, it's structured on an hourly rate, so the amount of time that it takes us to, to undertake the, the visit. And that allows our agents then to spend more time assessing whether or not there is any vulnerability at the property, whether um, uh, there is anything that might um, impact uh, the installation of a prepayment meter, advise the customer if they're present. Um, when, when an account gets to this stage in the process, we would have already undertaken a first visit, either ourselves or through uh, Richburns. Um, and at that point, the customer will have had anything between 20 and 40 pieces of communication from the energy provider and um, three or four uh, items of correspondence from us as well. Uh, we also try to uh, contact the customer by digital uh, messaging, by email, uh, if we have those kind of contact details. Qu quite often, mm -hmm. we don't actually have the name of the individual it's an occupier because neither the energy provider or us have been able to establish who's at the address at the time. So again, um, paying by an, uh, uh, the agent our time allows us to find out the, the occupant, um, if there's been a change of tenancy, and there are lots of other outcomes that can come at that point in time. So just so, so I'm clear, so there'd be ways in which you try to communicate and the energy suppliers will try to communicate uh, without face-to-face, -face, and then you would gain the warrant and then you would go and visit, or you'd visit, no, visit. visit, visit first, first visit, establish yes. the vulnerabilities. Yes. And then after that? And so after, at that point, we, uh, after the first visit, we send our information back to the energy provider and then they make a decision at that point when, if necessary, it's appropriate to go to a warrant. And that, that, will, that will generally be because we haven't been able to get a conclusion at a first visit. And quite, and quite often, that's because we haven't been able to make contact still with the customer. And then if, when you do gain that warrant, then you go back with the energy supplies. Yes. And then they put in the, the meter. Is that how it works? And, um, and for yourself, uh, Les Johnson, how, to, how does that work as well? I think succinctly explain the process. Um, the warrant is the final, very final part of that process. Prior to that, the energy company may have attempted to contact that customer 10, 20, 30 times by means they adopt. Only when that is failed is the file passed to Richburns or another company. We are then charged with trying to contact that customer we, we, we write, we telephone, we email, we SMS. Uh, ultimately, we visit. The purpose of that is to make contact, dialogue, get information, and feed that back to the energy company. In most cases, we succeed. Those files are passed back to the energy company. We get paid for those visits, for that process. We get paid to do that. Um, <coughs> Those files are then passed back to the energy company. It is then up to the energy company to decide what it then wishes to do. We will then, for those that we work for and we do warrants for, uh, receive files back and be requested on behalf of the energy company to apply for the warrants. And you discussed the process earlier this morning. We apply on behalf of the energy company for the warrant. Um, if granted, um, we will then action that warrant um, and on the basis of that action we will be paid um, by the energy company that is how the system works you get paid a warrant that is granted is that how you get paid or per application for a warrant no we get paid for a warrant being executed for carrying it out if the warrant's dismissed you don't get anything for it yes and, and, and if, if between the court issuing the warrant and it is um, pulled, something happens. We don't get paid for that. We only do get paid for what we do on the door, nothing else. 
Okay. <clears throat> Are you under any contractual obligation to adhere to the standard licence conditions? Yes, absolutely. With every energy company, absolutely. We're both nodding at that. And how do the energy suppliers that engage your services monitor your compliance with the standard licence conditions? We are audited routinely and regularly by every energy company. We have our own compliance department. So we operate the service level agreement and must apply that to the letter. We are audited, we are checked. Just go back a little bit. <clears throat> In terms of the correspondence that you have, how many correspondence would you say on average that you would attempt to achieve to make contact with the person? Through both the pre-warrant visits, pre-warrant, pre pre um, there could be numerous telephone calls, numerous text messages. On average? On visits, between one, two, maybe three at the most visits, we would three attempt that. And yeah, and that's physically going to the address and attempting to make contact. Okay, and correspondence? Um, one or two letters. Thank you, Chair. Do you employ your staff directly or do you subcontract uh, for some of the visits, for example? Can you help? Yes, um, so uh, we predominantly have self uh, predominantly employed uh, individuals. We have around 180 um, employed field agents. We do subcontract a small element um, to self employed agents in uh, areas with larger coverage, such as London, for example. And Mr. Johnson? Yes, yeah, similarly, we, we, we have self employed and employed agents. In relation to either the employed or self-employed, is any part of their reward structure uh, based uh, upon uh, the uh, number of uh, warrants that are secured uh, or the number of metres installed? No. no. So we, we operate um, a, a bonus scheme that uh, ensures that the, the visit uh, goes ahead. Mm. Um, the, uh, the result of that um, doesn't, doesn't matter uh, for our bonus scheme as, as long as the visit has, take, has, has, has gone ahead. So there will be no... Um, additional bonus for an agent that has uh, facilitated a prepayment installation and there is somebody that walks away because they've identified a vulnerability. Would you have the visit before or after the warrant? Sorry, I don't understand. Well, the, the visit takes place which they're rewarded for. Where does that take place in relation <coughs> to the warrant? That's, that's, so that's, bef that's before. The, before. The, the same okay. So you're saying yes. that's all done? Yes, yes. The, and the bonus yeah, scheme applies to the, to the first okay. visit and the, and the yeah, warrant. And, and Mr Johnson, from your point of view? Yes. Well, we incentivise our agents for a positive outcome and the definition of that is when you arrive at the door if, if you, the customer agrees to pay or part pay or make a payment arrangement um, there may be a change of tenancy information that's what we incentivise. Okay. Mr James did you want to come in on that point? Yeah. Just, Colin, you've just said you run a bonus scheme for visits taking place if it is someone's job to make those if it's a field agent's job to make those visits why do they need to be incentivised to make them? It's, it's just part of the, the, the routine that's, that's quite um, uh, consistent with the rest of the industry in that our agents are paid a, a basic salary and then there's a, an element of bonus around that. It's a per visit payment, not a, not a bonus depending on number of visits, for yeah. example. Yeah. Right. So it's a per visit. Per visit. Yeah. 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 So it's, 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 it's intended to drive to make sure that we, uh, we uh, make the visit and, and make sure that we have recorded an outcome for that visit that is appropriate. Thank you. If I may, Chair, yeah. to come in on this point, <coughs> the agent is incentivised to make contact and get information or put the customer in contact with the energy company. That takes time. So the longer the agent spends at the door, um, we, we reward that. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, right. yeah it does. Okay, okay thank you. Mr James. Uh, thank you. Um, Debbie Nolan, can I just check I've understood uh, your answer so far correctly? So, uh, you'll be given a list of customers by British Gas or other energy suppliers you work with. You'll go to visit those customers' homes to do a pre-visit where you'll check for any noticeable vulnerabilities. You'll record that information. You then send that back to British Gas or the other energy suppliers and the energy company gives you the go, no-go decision on whether to proceed with a warrant and a forced installation. Is that correct? Okay. Were you surprised when British Gas basically threw you under a bus and said they were shocked and horrored by the outcomes of the report and said it was your fault. I think, um, so I interpreted that message to be um, that they were, they were horrified by the behavior of our agent that had been reported in the press. Uh, I, I think that that was the focus of, uh, of their remarks rather than the surprise that uh, the visit had taken place because they, they, they check it at every single point um, before we um, go to the warrant. So they, they and, and they send an engineer and their locksmith as well, so they know that the visit is going um, is, is underway. So 
uh, my interpretation of that reaction was more around uh, the behaviour that had been reported. Which bit of the behaviour? Was it the way they knocked on the door, the way they broke in someone's house, the way they nuzzled a dog, the way that they intimidated the people in the home, the way they installed the, the, the prepayment meter? Which bit of the behaviour do you think was a shock to British Gas? I think the, the shock was from the, the, uh, the, the video footage that was uh, shared in the press, which um, indicated that our agent was uh, um, excited by the, um, uh, the, the, the forced entry into the property. But you recognised that British Gas were at every visit, so they would have known what was happening. British Gas were at the visit, yes. Uh, thank you. What training requirements do British Gas put on you to train your agents, and how do you report back to them that that training has been put in place? Uh, uh, we, uh, we create our own training um, uh, within our business, uh, but we do share all of that contact with our, our clients. Um, they also make sure um, that we are adhering to all of those processes in the same way that, that Les has just described us now, um, by, by way of audit. And just lastly, do you have a key point of contact at British Gas? Please don't give me their actual name, but in terms of their title, is it a senior person, a junior person? It's a senior Who, person, yes. What, do you know what the title is of the person's role? It's a, it's a, a director of uh, collections director title, I think, or customer services, apologies, I don't know exactly. It's kind of director it's, level role yeah, at yeah. British Gas. And, and just very lastly, briefly, in terms of your reporting back after you've done each visit, what information do you then give back post installation about how it went? So, so we um, provide an, uh, uh, an outcome code which will reflect the result and that could be that we've identified the, uh, the new occupants details, we've identified um, uh, some vulnerability, uh, we've identified um, di different things in the property um, and there's normally a narrative that accompanies that that our field agent has, has typed up on their handheld device that we send back to the, to the energy provider. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Ms Eagle. Thank you. Um, now, between the 1st of January 2019 and the 1st of December 2022, Roberto <coughs> were granted almost 300,000 right of entry warrants and Richburn over 130,000. I'm just going to come to each of you in turn, but these are huge numbers, huge numbers. Um, you at Avato have said that you handle 685,000 accounts each year for energy providers in the information that you've given to us. And 84% of those accounts are settled without the need for a warrant, which means 16% aren't settled without the need for a warrant. And that's by a rough calculation, because I'm not quite sure between which dates those numbers are. That's about 109,000 warrants. This is a significant number of warrants and business that you're doing. So how can you establish before you make applications? And how can you assure yourself that you've established whether there are any vulnerabilities that might make it uh, unsafe or uh, impractical to install a prepayment meter and actually put you in breach of the law by doing so. How do you, how do you satisfy yourselves about that, given the huge increase in numbers that we're talking about here? Well, the, uh, the energy providers have all of that information. They have the information that we have collected, if we have anything, from the first visit. Um, uh, but in, in between our visit and um, their next stage, there may well have been some interaction with their customer directly. We don't know that, so we rely on the um, energy provider uh, providing us that information. We are applying for the warrant on their behalf, uh, and therefore we're relying on the information so that they You don't see it primarily as your focus to try and discover this. You just do what, your con what your, the company you're working for tells you to do. Leave all that to them about vulnerabilities. We, we, we um, allow them to make the decision or, or rely on them to make the decision on the information that they have because they are the licence holder. So we are acting as an agent on their behalf to apply for the warrant once they have gone through those checks. And there are many checks through that process, um, in, in including in some, some of our energy provider clients. Um, we, we have a checkpoint at the, at the beginning of the day. We have a checkpoint when we're at the property. We have another checkpoint post the visit. So there's, there's lots of different variations on that to, to different clients. Um, Mr Johnson, how do you satisfy yourself uh, in the same way about whether or not there are vulnerabilities? Um, explain to you the pre-warrant visit process. That is our opportunity when our agent visits the premises once or twice or maybe three times. If they make contact with the customer, that is the point at which we can identify vulnerability. If we cannot make contact with the customer, we cannot report what we don't know. So we report that back to the energy company. When we receive the application for the warrant, and we go through the warrant process and then we conduct the warrant visit, if when the officer arrives with that warrant, they identify vulnerability, 
they will report that to the energy company and walk away. Indeed, that happens in 25% of the warrants that we act action. 25%. So it, 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 we identify at the door and report it to the energy company. It is only when you make contact with the client that you can identify if the client or the customer does not make contact with the energy company or us, we cannot report what we don't know. Is not that itself a, a, a signal of vulnerability in many cases? No. When someone's been attempted to be contacted 20, 30 times, I, I don't know what we do about that. That, 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 is what ha that is the reality of what we deal with day in, day out. Ms Nolan, now, what percentage of... of uh, uh, how do you make sure that um, uh, there are no vulnerable members of a household when you haven't been able to establish any contact? Well, uh, what, one example is one of the articles that was in the, featured in the press was, was an individual that um, uh, we hadn't been able to establish contact with before um, the warrants. When we arrived with the warrant, we identified that the, the, the customer was, was present. She had three children plus a newborn baby. So our agent walked away and that was reported in that press article also. So it, it happens very regularly. Um, but Can you give us a slightly more precise percentage or get back to us with one? I very happily get back to you with something Thank in writing. You. Thank you. Um, in, in, in carrying out, so I mean, you've had 300,000 right of entry warrants between January 2019, December 2022. Um, how can you, can you give us any figures about how many vulnerable customers you identified out of, of those and therefore didn't proceed? And uh, Mr. Johnson, you, you, you're 130,000. Sounds like you've got some figures in your head already, if you can say 25%. Suspiciously round number, however, but nonetheless. It roughly, is a fact. It's a fact, OK. Uh, it would be nice to have some precise information from your management systems about precisely how many vulnerable customers were identified at this stage. Because one of the concerns that I certainly have is that the vulnerability of the customer is not actually being focused upon in the way in which it ought to be and whether that's your responsibility or the or the license holders responsibility the companies you work for that nonetheless is somebody's responsibility and so it'd be interesting to see see the figures that you that, that you have if you could undertake Happy to do that then perhaps you could yeah. write get, us. Get could, could I us. comment on the point that's just been made because yeah. it might be helpful um, Almost half of the warrants we are issued with, are, we, we classify as walk away, we don't action, because things happen. 25% of those we identify on visit as a vulnerability. It is a round number. 25% of the half? Or, yes, 25% of the half, the half yes, of those that we carry out. Right. Um, ha if we, as a collection agency, were ignoring vulnerability at the doorstep, we would be flooded with complaints in court cases. Now, to give you some accurate figures, last year we had 209 complaints out of the numbers you've quoted. 209 complaints. Do you understand, however, I don't necessarily accept the premise of what you're saying there, but do you understand that part of vulnerability in many instances is the incapacity to act? And therefore, I don't think it's fair to say that we'd be flooded with complaints. People just think there's one more thing weighing me down. Um, you know, that is the concern, and many of people with vulnerabilities aren't capable of acting for various reasons, or don't feel able to, or aren't, or don't. That is one of the concerns, isn't it? I, I can accept that point, yeah. yeah. Okay, now, you, you refer, um, uh, Rich, Rich Burns, you've given us um, a, a sequence of how you go through things, and you've referred to some of it uh, today. <coughs> you refer to... Um, uh, customers being sent a human rights letter which informs them of the application process. What, what's in this human rights letter? It's a, a funny description for a letter that you're sending to customers you're about to We are required to do that. That is the regulation that we are required to, to act upon. It informs the customer um, of the situation and what they must do uh, and, and the timetable. What it asks them to do is to make contact with us or the energy company. Again, it's back to what I explained earlier. We're trying to get dialogue, communication. That is how most of these cases are resolved. Why do you refer to it as a human rights letter? It, it is just the terminology that, that exists. Okay, okay. Right, I think, um, Perhaps you could supply us with an example. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Turner. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. You mentioned... Uh, 
Mr Johnston, in answer to my colleague's questioning, uh, that you'd be flooded with complaints, and you've answered that to a degree and accepted what was put to you, but you also mention uh, you'd be flooded with court cases. How do you propose that one of the vulnerable people we're speaking about here might bring an action against your hugely powerful business? Is that possible, do you think? Sorry, I don't understand your question. Well, a vulnerable person who's having the door smashed in and one of these pre-payment meters installed against the will, how do you expect that vulnerable person to take an action against your business? Because I think that's what you said in answer to questions from my colleague. Okay, because this is giving facts. We don't smash doors in, firstly. You force entry, don't you? You have a warrant to enter the property. Lawfully. And against, well, lawfully I accept, but against the will of the occupant of that property, you install a meter. By virtue of that, we can assume those persons are vulnerable. How do you expect those vulnerable people to bring an action against your big business? I can't answer that, obviously. I, can't, I cannot answer that question. You cannot, or you don't want to answer it? No, it's, I, I can't answer it. You're asking me the impossible. I can't answer for every individual. OK, let's move on then. Uh, when you uh, apply for a warrant, how do you decide which court to use? Side of you. Okay, so, so we're, Any, we're, you know, we, are, we are nominated at um, a bulk court, which is uh, Portsmouth. Sorry, say again. We, we are assigned a court. Right, and who assigns that to you? Um, I'd have to say I don't know. I need to check. Do you not think it might have been worth asking the question if you're assigned a court? Is it the court system is that court, assigns yeah. it to is it an original? Is it HMCTS? Sorry? The Magistrates Courts for Tribunal Service? Or? I think so. I think so. I think so. And who applies for the warrants? We apply, the, the, the collection agency applies on behalf of the energy company. And what information are your agents asked to attest to under oath? That uh, all the checks, the prescribed checks have been carried out. We haven't not at that stage identified any vulnerability. Just, just remind us again, what are those pres prescribed checks that you talk about? Um, that we have sent the human rights letter, we have visited, we have attempted to contact, <coughs> the debt is legitimate and valid, and that we have not identified any vulnerability or any other reason that we should not apply for the warrant. And I think I'm right in saying in September 2019, the system changed to the bulk upload procedure for the warrants. How did that affect your approach, if at all? Did it affect your approach to the way you do your business? Um, it, ha it certainly hasn't affected the approach in terms of the, the checks that we undertake before, uh, before we go to that warrant application. Uh, I would answer the same, yeah. After warrants obtained, what further steps are taken before prepayment meter is forcibly installed? A prepayment meter is not installed in every single warrant. I, I may have a statistic for you. In terms of the prepayment meters, um, <coughs> it is only a, a percentage of the warrants actually carried out where PPMs are fitted. In our case, Richburns, of all the files we receive right from the very beginning, it is less than 4% prepayment meters fitted. Yeah, and the, sa the same for us, we have 4%. Okay. Tell me with this then. Um, how many prepayment meters did you uh, forcibly install in 2022? Uh, in, uh, the rich ones would have fitted about 14,500 from knowledge. 14,500. Yes. So, so my numbers are 58,000 since 2020. 58,000 since 2020. 2020. Uh, but we don't fit the prepayment meter. Uh, our energy providers do that. We arrange for the warrant. How do you ensure that your agents comply with the standard licence conditions on vulnerability and uh, safety? So we receive instructions from our clients uh, that, that set that out specifically so that we can make those checks. 
um, there are a number of, of checks along the process to make sure that everything has been covered and checked. In terms of the Times investigation, which you'll, you're no doubt familiar with, yeah? You read that, those reports? Yes. You took a proper interest in, in that, no doubt? Yes. Now, uh, that report suggested that agents had acted in breach of the standard licence conditions relating to uh, customers' vulnerability, uh, vulnerable situations, rather. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, because the, uh, if in one of the cases that was reported in the press was specifically around an individual who, who, who had clearly had a vulnerability, but we identified that on the visit and then we walked away. So that is, that's exactly in line with the conditions. So it must have been upsetting for you to be criticised by those that were instructing you. British Gas at all. Well, British Gas at that point did not know that that customer had any vulnerability that we were aware of. That was the first time that any of us had managed to make contact with her. Tell me, Debbie Nolan, what, what is the most rewarding part of your business? The most rewarding part is that we do get plenty of thank yous from, from individuals and customers who have found that the visit to their property has been helpful to them. Um, as has been mentioned earlier, sometimes um, uh, people, particularly in vulnerable situations, aren't able to make telephone calls or understand letters, so the, the first initial visit is actually very helpful to some people. Plenty of thank yous. Yes. Mr Johnston? Um, I wouldn't say the thank yous, but we do resolve most of the cases. As I said to you, it's less than 4% that goes to this extreme level. Um, a lot of it gets resolved well before through the processes that I've already explained. We don't just turn up with a warrant. There is a long <laughs> tail to it. Thank you, Chair. Hey, can I just ask you? Yeah, yeah. One, two people want to come in. Hey. Mr. Brown, I caught my eye first, Mr. David. I, I thank <laughs> Chair. Um, I was going to ask about the, the numbers of prepayment meters, and it seemed to be an answer there. So, well, as you said, four percent of warrant applications result in insulation of prepayment meters. No, four four percent of all the files we receive, it ends up less than four percent that we go to. How many of the warrant applications of the hundred thirty thousand end up? In Prepayment would, meters. Well, I've, I've given you that figure so already, that 14 four, and four, a half thousand last year. Right. And so, Debbie, can you say how many of the warrant applications end up percentage wise in insulation of prepayment meter? Again, same, 4%. Because you said 58,000 prepayment meters That's were. Uh, that was um, since 2020. So yep. That was the number there. And by my figures, you applied for 285,000 warrants from. 2020, so that's 20 per cent surely end up prepayment meters for our VATO rather than 4 per cent. So 4 per cent of all of the accounts that we receive, so it's 4 per cent of the accounts that we receive, as Mr Johnson explains, it's not 4 per cent. 20 per cent of the, what, percent of the ones you apply for ended up prepayment meters being installed in. I, I don't have that number to hand, but I can absolutely confirm that to you in writing. Could you if that's we would like that in writing, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mr Lavery and then Ms Eagle. Thanks. J just very briefly, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at what, I, what I've just heard, by the way, that you know both Mr. Johnson and Ms. Nolan suggesting that the one of the, the best parts of the the job is thank you letters from um, some of the most vulnerable people in in our communities. The fact that you uh, don't smash the doors down, Mr. Johnson, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, but I'm sure you haven't got keys to get in. Uh, and I'm sure that people don't welcome you and open the door and say, come in and put the meter where you might want it. These are the most vulnerable people in our communities. That's why your companies are making fortunes from the energy companies who in turn are making fortunes uh, at a time where people can barely put uh, bread on the table because of the cost of living crisis. And yet you're sitting in front of this committee suggesting that the most rewarding part of the job is the thank you letters you get from individuals. I just find that uh, absolutely unbelievable. I just leave it there. Well, it's more, uh, it's more a comment than a question, but if people want to come Can back to it. Uh, Can I respond, Chair? Yeah, of course. Um, I did not say that was the most rewarding part. I did not say that. We do not smash doors in. How, how do you get in? Most, we see. enter with agreement from the customer. I see. We don't smash doors in. Otherwise you've got a locksmith. Yes. I see. 
Okay. <laughs> I see, yeah. Right. Um, uh, just, we, we need to come towards the end of this topic. Um, Ms Eagle, do you want to go in? Yeah, I just, I just um, I wonder, given that um, since uh, Lord Justice Edis, the senior presiding judges, put a stop to warrants being granted at the moment in the courts, uh, uh, because Ofgem has become sufficiently concerned at the operation of suppliers to ask all energy companies to suspend forced installation. Um, are you conducting retrospective checks to establish how many prepayment meters have been installed in the homes of customers with vulnerabilities? Are you doing that, Debbie Nolan? We, we can certainly look into the accounts where we know a prepayment meter has been installed and, and review the account to see if there has been any vulnerability identified at any stage of the process. Um, no, are you, do, are you going back retrospectively and looking where you've installed the meter, uh, whether or not there are vulnerabilities? Not are you checking your files to see whether you'd identified we don't vulnerabilities? Install, we don't install the meter, that's why I'm asking, answering that you, way. You are, you are present when are the meter present, is yes. installed. Yes. Um, because you are executing the warrant. Yes. So are you doing any retrospective checks where there is a, a, a meter installed? Has British Gas asked you to do any retrospective checks on vulnerability? So British Gas has asked us to provide us all the information that we have on our accounts, and, and that includes any information that we have on vulnerability that we have sent to them. So yes, well, we are providing that. That is just providing them with information they've already had during the process. That is not a retrospective check on vulnerability where a meter has been installed, is it? Well, it depends on your assessment for vulnerability because it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to assess that retrospectively because quite often it's transient and there's different things that happen that we aren't aware of because it's on our, our client system. We can only answer the information that we have on, on our files, but we're very happily sharing that with our clients, including British Gas. So you, you would say that by providing extracts or the whole copies of your existing files, that amounts to a retrospective check to establish if there's vulnerability, would you? Is that the very start of the process, yes, to understand it, yes. But as far as you're aware, is there any proactive work going on to go to places where these meters have been installed and check whether the people there are vulnerable? My, my understanding is that that is, that is underway at the moment. We are not doing that work. You're not doing that, that no, no, but it is happening. We, we have been instructed by British Gas to return all of their accounts and I not see. to act on their behalf at the moment. So at the moment, we are not doing anything for British Gas. I understand. And Mr Johnson, the same question to you. If, if I may help, um, we have not been asked by any energy company to do, to, to do what you suggest, nor will we have the information. The information, once we, the warrant is executed, that relationship is between the customer and the energy company. So you wouldn't be able to do that. We wouldn't even be involved if you were beyond that point. No. Okay. If that helps. A final thing: um, if a prepayment meter is installed, what's the typical cost of enforcement that gets passed on to the customer? Can you help me with that? I don't know that. I'm afraid, Chair. Well, it would be quite an important bit of information to have in your records, wouldn't it? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be us that applies that charge to the customer. I see. So it Who would? would? Be the energy provider. Okay, it's so the energy provider we yeah, want to so ask. We would, okay, we would fair enough. Information. Yeah, okay. Uh, same with yes, you? Yes, the energy okay. company would. Yeah, the very last one, Mr. Turner, because then we need to hand over. Thank you, Chair. So after several visits, um, <laughs> the vulnerable single mother very often allows your agents in to fit the meter, or indeed a locksmith doesn't smash the door down, but forces entry and fits the meter. That's a costly process, isn't it? Do you not bother to make the inquiry about how much of that cost is passed to the consumer? Do you not bother to ask those that instruct you how much of that cost is passed on to that vulnerable person? Do you not do that? Why not? Why ever not? To the best of my knowledge, I believe the fee is £150, but I would have to confirm that in writing to the committee. Okay, well, if you could do that. But if that's the thing those vulnerable people are writing to you to thank you about. If you could confirm that to us, Mr. M M M M M M Ms. Nolan? Sorry? Uh, well, Mr. Um, Johnson was able to give a figure. Yes. Can you? Um, I, I, I can't, but I, I can okay. certainly... If you can find out, come writing. back to us. Yeah. Then, then we will. Well, Thank you for your evidence, very grateful to you, uh, and um, we'll now suspend briefly to um, hand over the chair to Mr James. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, welcome back to this joint committee hearing of the Justice and Business and Energy Committee on forced installation of prepayment meters. We now welcome uh, Chris O'Shea, Chief Executive of Centrica, the owner of British Gas, and Bill Bullen, uh, the Chief Executive of uh, Utilitar.
Um, Mr. O'Shea, at first, as I understand it, the license, license conditions that Ofgem place upon you state that you can only forcibly install a prepayment meter if it's, quote, safe and reasonably practical in all the circumstances to do so, and that guidance from the regulator says that the supplier should assess each individual case on its merits. Uh, do you acknowledge that? Yes. Um, the same guidance goes on to say that the warrant must not be used where such action would be severely traumatic to a customer due to an existing vulnerability which relates to that person's mental capacity or psychological state, which would be made significantly worse by the experience. Uh, do you acknowledge that? Yes. The Times reported that British Gas agents broke into the home of a young mother with a four-week-old baby who, alongside her seven-, two-, and one-year-old child, was crying and rocking her newborn baby whilst your agents tried to forcibly fit an electricity meter that she knew would automatically disconnect because she couldn't afford to pay her energy bills. That case that British Gas presumably signed off, was that in compliance with your licence conditions, Mr O'Shea? Firstly, if I may, Chair, that case reported by the media did not result in a prepayment meter being installed. That case was a, a customer that we had made around 50 attempts to contact, including a home visit where there was no answer. A uh, customer that hadn't made a payment since November 2021, who owes over £3,000 of energy debt, continues to run up debt at the rate of £160 a month. As soon as the agents saw that there was a vulnerability to the newborn baby, they walked away. They okay. identified a vulnerability, which I think is exactly in keeping with the licence conditions. Thank you. It was also reported that British gas agents broke into the home of a woman in her 50s with known severe mental health problems and bipolar disorder. Was that case in compliance with your licence conditions? I don't have the details of that case. It was also reported that British gas broke into the home of a woman registered as partially sighted and disabled with known arthritis and mobility problems. Was that case, which was also signed off by British Gas, in line with your licence conditions? Again, I don't have the details of that case. You don't have the details of individual cases, but you acknowledge, do you, Mr O'Shea, that somebody at British Gas has to sign off on each and every visit to somebody's home to break in and forcibly install a prepayment meter? The process that we follow at first is, on average, we make 24 attempts to contact a customer before we apply for a warrant. And if it might help, I would say in 2022, we applied for 92, we applied for and were granted 92,500 warrants. Of the 92,500 warrants, immediately upon being granted those warrants, we write to the customer <coughs> to let them know that that's been applied. 34,000 of those warrants resulted in a resolution. Either the customer acknowledged the debt, entered into a prepayment plan, there'd been a change of tenancy, the customer moved away. We identified the vulnerability because as your previous witness said, vulnerabilities are transient and can change. Or we had a customer who voluntarily asked for a prepayment meter. Of the remaining 58,000, we installed 20,469 prepayment meters under warrant. Uh, we had 12,000 customer cases which uh, resulted in payments. We had 4,000 customers where we identified a vulnerability after being awarded the warrant and walked away. So it sometimes is not possible to identify a vulnerability because customers will simply refuse to engage. If we identify a vulnerability, we don't install prepayment meters. Now, we have an independent investigation going on just now. Ofgem have also launched an I'll come to that in a second, Mr O'Shea, if that's okay. We'll, we'll talk about follow-up actions um, uh, in a moment. It was reported that there were Excel spreadsheets that your agents of Arto had where customers were listed, their vulnerabilities were noted, and that information was circulated to all field agents on a weekly basis. And we just heard from Avato, your bailiffs, that somebody at British Gas had to give the go, no go decision on each and every case. Who in British Gas gave the go, no go decision to enter into all of the homes I've just The head of set customer up? debt collections. The head of the, customer debt collections. Give the go, no go. And, and sorry, on, on that, just to be clear, we will issue sometimes to the debt collection agency a proceed with caution notice where we suspect there may be a vulnerability, but we're not sure. So we're quite clear on that. Now, that would be if you see a spreadsheet which says there may be a vulnerability. Again, vulnerability can be transient. I would also say that the off-gem definition of vulnerability applies to the customer. We apply that definition to the household. So we have a, we have a procedure, a policy, which is more stringent than the off-gem definition. Okay. But if we suspect there's a vulnerability, we'll let the debt collector know. But we can't confirm that if we can't make contact with the customer. So it's your head of debt collection uh, management at British Gas that signs off on these cases 
Who does that person report to in British Gas in terms of your compliance with its licence conditions? We would report to the head of customer operations who reports to the head of British Gas Energy. And at what point does that get to board level? The, British, you have, the way that we operate in, within Centrica is we have eight separate business units, each of which have a managing director. And we have uh, compliance reports, we have uh, an audit and risk committee, and the way that it would work is that the British Gas Energy would have compliance reviews and would identify risks. And those risks, if they're material for the group, would then find their way onto the group risk register. The signing off of the application for warrants does not come to the board. It does, however, go through um, the head of regulation, which sits in the General Counsel's Department, but it wouldn't come to the Centrica board. I've got the terms of reference here for your Audit and Risk Committee, and it sounds very reasonable. It says there's a number of internal audits done on a quarterly basis. There's quarterly reports to the group risk management uh, function uh, that those internal audits are uh, checked and that there is a review uh, to highlight any material risks and incidences of non-compliance with your sector-specific legal and regulatory obligations. All of the cases that have been reported, and these are only some of them, are, to me, a very clear breach of your licence conditions. That would be a material risk that ought to be reported at your Audit and Risk Committee. Has a paper ever gone to your Audit and Risk Committee to discuss these types of breaches? Firstly, I would say, Chair, that to prejudge the outcome of either the off-gem investigation or our investigation would be highly I'm just giving unusual. you my view, Mr O'Shea. I asked in, if it's ever been reported to your in, Audit and Risk Committee. Indeed, I, I understand. But I think the premise of your question is that there has been a breach. The investigation will establish whether there's been a my breach. My question is whether there's been a report to your Audit and Risk Committee of a breach. And my point is that there has not yet been established whether there's been a breach. But could there you just answer my question very specifically? Has there ever been a report to your Audit and Risk Committee that has dealt with the issue of forced installation of prepayment meters by British Gas? Yes or no? So there has been a discussion at the Centrica Board last year about the whole issue of prepayment meters after the, uh, the reports in the I newspaper referred to before. To the best of my knowledge, there's been no report to the Audit and Risk Committee because we have not yet identified a breach. The first that the potential breaches came to my attention was in the media reports. They were launched an investigation. Now, that will go to the Centrica Audit and Risk Committee, but because there have been no established breaches right now, there's been no report to the Audit Committee, to the best of my knowledge. I'm surprised that the first you heard about it was the Times story. I mean, there's been lots of news reports over many, many years, including, to be fair, before the time you were with uh, British Gas, of the company forcibly installing prepayment meters. And indeed, in 2018, just before you joined uh, the board as, I think, Chief Financial Officer, Ofgem issued a warning to British Gas for having a rate double the industry average and had said that you needed to bring that number down. It's actually gone up very significantly. So the business... British Gas has known for many, many years that this is a concern of the regulator about the forcible installation of prepayment meters by the business. So I'm, I'm, I'm confused as to why you've only just kind of encountered this issue because of a Times expose. This looks like a systemic issue at British Gas that ought to be reported on, isn't it? Firstly, the data that you have is incorrect. The number of prepayment meters installed under warrant has actually reduced for British Gas. In 2019, it was 23,000. In 2020, it was 8,000. In 2021, it was 21,000. And in 2022, it was 20,000. You're one of the highest in the sector, aren't you? 469. We're the largest energy company in the sector. You've also got to bear in mind that the number At of... Rate per customer, you're still the highest user of these, though, aren't you? No, because we have 1.2 million prepayment customers. We have another 6.3 million customers who we afford credit to. Now, a lot of those prepayment customers are there because they're, they're voluntary prepayment customers. It, you will have companies that have no prepayment customers and you'll have companies that have only prepayment customers. So you've got to look at what we would call the social uh, economic mix of the customer book. But the numbers of ins installations by British Gas has actually come down in that period. Are you concerned that your internal audit compliance and risk reporting is inadequate if these issues have not been escalated to you previously, given that you seem to know nothing about it? One of the things that I was most disappointed about, and the reason that I was very upset with the media reports was we had actually had an internal audit team out with our VATO um, weeks before those reports and had identified no issues. So this is not, the installation of prepayment meters under warrant is not something that came to my attention as a result of the media reports. The allegations that there was improper behaviour is what came to my attention through the media reports. And what we immediately did upon that was to suspend work with our VATO and to launch an investigation to establish the facts, to understand whether the instances we saw reported were isolated 
or systemic. Now, that report is ongoing just now. I think it's very important that we understand um, from the cases that have been reported, but also from a statistically significant sample, whether there is a systemic issue. The problem we have, Mr O'Shea, is that Avato have said they just did what you told them to do, and you're saying it was Avato's problem that these issues have happened, and we seem to be going around in circles, so we'll look forward to reading your report. Just lastly, from me at this stage, um, if you were so sad about this story, uh, how much of your £3 billion in profits have you allocated to compensation for the victims of your actions? So, firstly, on your previous comment, are Vato or a subcontractor, Centrica, to British Gas? So this is not around going in circles. I think that your assertion is, is a bit unfair. The I'm entitled to my view, Mr O'Shea. I asked you a question, though. How much of your £3 billion in profits have you allocated to compensation to the victims of your actions? Again, at the risk of repeating myself, I think it's important we establish exactly what's gone on here. You're not compensating. If, we, if, if you permit me to finish, if we identify that we have acted incorrectly, I've been very clear, we will make that right. I can only answer that question when we have the results of our investigation. Okay, so, so I'm clear, at this stage, irrespective of all the testimony, the story and the evidence, you're saying to this committee that you're not admitting that British Gas has had failings in the forced installation of prepayment metres. I need to see the result of, a, of the investigation. That's astonishing, isn't it, Mr O'Shea, given the stories of real situations that have been reported. And you're here today saying that you don't know whether those are legitimate stories or not. These were real people that were reported in real time by an investigative journalist with your employees and your agents, causing enormous amounts of distress to them. And you're not even acknowledging that that was something that happened. So, to Chair, I, I think that's a misrepresentation of what I'm saying. One of the cases that was reported by the media is an individual that we had attempted to uh, contact on many occasions. We actually don't know the name of the person. They're a tenant in the property. We installed a prepayment meter that was reported by the media. That person has not complained. We still cannot make contact with that person. We don't know their name. However, with the prepayment meter installed, they have started to reduce their debt. This is a very, very difficult situation that we're in, which is in any other industry. If we afforded credit to people that we knew couldn't pay, that would be a breach of our business and potential licence conditions. So we're caught in a very difficult position. But I'm not saying that it's clear that nothing has gone wrong. What I'm saying is we need to have a proper investigation. And often these are very complex debt pathways. They take months. On average, it takes about six months before we even apply for a warrant. We have to go back and check all of that. We're checking. The rover. We've got 20 people working on this. We've got external advisors working on it as well. There's 150 documents that are going through. We need to trace every every step in the path to make sure whether we got it right or wrong, not just for the cases identified, but for the hundreds of additional random samples that we've taken. You probably should have allocated those resources to doing it right in the first place. Do you regret that? I can't say at the moment whether okay. this has not been done properly. Thank you. Uh, Mr Bullant, just to uh, very briefly before I open to colleagues, uh, Ofgem, the regulator, did a compliance review of these processes and remarkably British Gas was the <coughs> energy, only energy company that came out saying there were no issues with their processes and your business, Utilita, was at the bottom of the ranking is saying severe weaknesses. Which if this is happening at British Gas, what on earth is happening at Utilita? And if it's not a problem, why did Ofgem say that? Which compliance review are you talking about? This is the market compliance review in September 2022. About direct debits? About the forced installation of prepayment meters and how vulnerable customers are being treated. So and they, they divided the suppliers into four brackets. No significant issues, British Gas. Minor weaknesses, a whole list of others. Moderate weaknesses, a whole list of others. Severe weaknesses, true energy, utility and Scottish power. You must know yeah. what I'm talking about, Mr. Indeed, Mullen. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. The, um, Ofgem has carried out a number of compl market compliance um, in, uh, reviews during the year. Um, I am, I'm aware of that. Um, we were very unhappy with that result. I, you know, I think the practicalities of the situation are you know, that actually we, we have a very good process. Fundamentally, we have the same difficulties as British Gas in contacting customers. Um, obviously, we have a large number of customers that have um, you know, financial difficulties because we specialise in doing prepay. But because we uh, actually special, specialise in doing smart prepay, um, I think you find that the, the experience of customers is, is very different. Um, the Which Consumer Organisation just published a, a report recently that ranks suppliers um, we didn't come top, Octopus did, as they often do, but we came second. And for a company that's got 90% of its customers <laughs> prepay, I think you'll find that's a, a pretty good result. So I was disappointed with that 
review by Ofgem. I was also disappointed with the review that they did into direct debit payments, which I found was equally inaccurate based on the, the objective information that Ofgem had available. Um, but obviously, I don't run Ofgem. So. That, that, that's the important point. I just want to try to um, flesh out a bit. So you, Ofgem found that you were one of the worst suppliers, whereas British Gas is one of the best suppliers. But as, as I've just said out, British Gas's actions, as far as it's been reported, were completely inadequate. Yeah. Uh, but your assessment, I think, is what you're saying, is that the way in which Ofgem assessed <coughs> outcomes was not good enough. That, well, that would be the conclusion I would come to. I mean, I don't know exactly, I wasn't you know, privy to exactly what went on in Ofgem. All I can talk about are the outcomes that we have for customers. Um, we processed something like 2,500 um, warrant uh, um, installations. They didn't all end up as a warrant installation, but we've, you know, we've got evidence <coughs> where we've aborted and installed because of a vulnerability turning up at the last minute. But as I say, you know, the key difference with Utilita is that we don't install dumb prepay meters. Um, and as has already been said, uh, vulnerabilities are transient, and um, where a vulnerability turns up post that installation, we have the ability to switch a customer back into credit mode, which is something that we do all the time. Hundreds per week we switch back into credit mode, and some hundreds per week are being switched into prepay mode, or at least were until the suspension. Okay, thank you. Alan Brown, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, if I go to uh, Ms. Roche, um, just wondering if you can set out exactly how your contract with Arvato is structured, but also if we start at the beginning before we get to the awful end point where people are getting forced into having a prepayment meter, how quickly does Arvato get involved? So the, the contract structure with Arvato, where we, we have a full outsourcing of our debt collection, but what we do is we identify, obviously, we know customers that pay and customers that don't pay. So we will identify customers uh, that don't pay. We will make attempts to get in touch with customers. When those fail, then we pass that on to, to Arvato. How, how, do you then, how do you have a list of those that don't pay? Is that we just we monitor accounts. Right. So these, these, are for, these are for customers, because obviously on prepayment meters, um, we monitor that differently. But for customers that either pay by direct debit, the direct debit gets cancelled or your customers pay what we call cash checks. So we've got the two million customers that do that. And if they get a bill and then they've not paid it within their terms, we don't immediately pass that on to the debt collectors. We try to get in touch with the, with the customer. Um, what we're always trying to do, we offer payment plans. We'll offer payment plans up to five years. The, we'll, we'll pass this on where we, the customer is simply not engaging with us or where the debt gets, gets quite aged. When did Arvato get involved then? When did the trigger point? We'll, so we'll be at the point where we think that there is a problem with act us actually getting paid with the customer. So we would then pass that on to Arvato. And it's not, they, it's not really, Arvato will do debt collection, but it's not just about the installation of prepayment meters, it's about the recovery of debt. I'll give you a personal example from my London flat then. No notification from British Gas that a bill is due. Nothing from British Gas saying the bill's now overdue. But I got an email from Arvato looking for payment. Mm. Now I checked, with, it was <clears throat> when I go online and I check what the bill that was created and when British Gas was saying the bill was due by, Arvato were sending an email within a calendar month. So that doesn't suggest to me that proper checks are going on and that British Gas are engaging and doing stuff before they actually pass the debt agency. And I know it's not good for people watching outside the room. I'll give pass on that email. So that's email I've received from Arvato. If you want to look at it, it doesn't reference a gas bill once. It doesn't reference a bill at all. It tells me to visit a secure rise notification with a link. <coughs> now, when I see that, I think that's a phishing email. I think that's a scam. Mm. There's nothing there that suggests it's a gas bill. Nothing says it's overdue. There's telephone numbers. And there's nothing there about circumstances, vulnerabilities or anything. So do you think that's acceptable? And is that part of your contract with Arvato? I mean, if people are receiving emails like that, it's no wonder they're not engaging. Mr Brown, I mean, I'm going to have to take this away and understand exactly what happened in the, in the process in the face of it. That email is not a good email. I mean, I know that that's about your gas bill because I can see your customer number. I don't expect you to remember your customer number for your gas bill. But I'll need to go away and look into that. Well, that's the start of the process with British Gas and Arvato. That's the start of a debt being possibly being added to customer accounts, isn't it? Well, no, because the consumption of gas and electricity by you and your flat is what adds the debt. 
This is this is not what adds to the debt. So the question we're, is, the, so the we no, no fee from Arvato then. Sorry, there's no fee once it For goes this? to Arvato. No, no. So the I mean the question previously was about the cost of the of the uh, pavement meter installation. Mm. It's 150 pounds. Uh, we charge £56 to the customer on grant uh, reward <coughs> and £94 on the installation of the meter. The payment for this, that's, that's, that's for our account. But I'd, I would like to look into this. Um, did you raise anything with British Gas when this happened? Not at the time, no. Mm. Um, okay, so, so I'll, 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 I'll follow up on this. There, but but, but okay. there's no charge to the customer for this. And if the customer gets in touch, if the, if the bill's not come through or there's been no reminder, then, then clearly there's an issue and we fix that. But isn't that the case? That's already passed the debt collection agency. So from then on, they're going to be chasing and chasing, and they're clearly then current fees that are going to be added to the account. Surely, no, no, no the fees are the, 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 the fees that were would be added to the uh, to the account would be um, when we've been through the 150 pounds, which is not a true reflection of actually the cost of doing this. That's a cap that Ofgem have put in place. I think that was put in place in 2017. Yeah. But no, there'll be no, there's no cost to you for that. So Arvat will start chasing up as debt collection agency and there's no fees incurred to the customer? We, 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 we pay for that because it, it's... You're we swallowing are, that money? We, well, because either we have an in-house team, this is, this is part of serving the customer, so either we have an in-house team or we have a team that's, that's outsourced, that cost is, is for us. We're allowed to recover £150 where we install a prepayment. We don't recover that in every case where we identify severe financial vulnerability. Much is done in-house and much is outsourced. So, as the, as the previous witness said, we've, we've outsourced our entire debt collection uh, to Arvato. We have a team uh, internally who monitor that. We have three full-time uh, colleagues, and it's part of the, debt, the, the customer collections team that the full activity for collecting debt has been outsourced to Arvato. And the money that is added to customers' bills once they got a prepayment meter um, forcibly installed, how, how long do they get to pay that back? Well, on average, customers paying back all the debt that they would have in a prepayment, because obviously with the cus customers that we install a prepayment meter for under warrant on average owes more than £1,000. The average repayment rate is £5 a week, and it can be as low as £3.25, and this would simply be added on to that. That's £150, you said, so it's added on to that. Unless there's severe financial vulnerability, and then we don't charge it, we absorb that ourselves. Thank you. Um, can I just clarify something uh, briefly? Uh, earlier, uh, Mr. Shea, you gave us numbers about forced installation of prepayment meters. Can I just check there's no distinction between going in and installing a prepayment meter and installing a smart meter that's later converted to a prepayment meter? Was it inclusive of all of those actions? So, so the numbers, um, so the 20,469 number that I gave you for prepayment meters being installed last year, there was an additional 6,000, uh, which is called business driven mode change, which was a change from a um, it's a smart meter changing from a credit meter to a prepayment meter. It's 6,000 on top of yes. the numbers you gave. Yeah, to 26,500, yes. Okay, thank you. Mark Jenkinson, please. Sorry, Chair, if you'll indulge me, uh, that was one of the questions I had, and I'm not <coughs> sure that you actually answered the question that Mr Jones asked. The number that you gave about prepayment installations, yes. you've then added another 6,000 on which were mode change afterwards. There are circumstances in which you would enter a property, install a smart meter, potentially in credit mode, um, for that mode change to take place afterwards. Not, for, right? not forcibly, no. So we would install. It would always be a prepayment. You would leave the property in prepayment mode on every occasion. That, I mean, that's it, unless there's unless there's a mistake. Yes, because customers would have would go from what are called dumb meters to smart meters. Yeah. Um, uh, they ha they have to agree to that. And so um, it's part of our off-gem mandate that we need to um, reach a certain number of customers. But no, we would never forcibly enter a customer's premises to, to change <coughs> an old, what we call a dumb yeah. credit meter for a, a smart meter. any circumstances, it would always be left in prepayment mode unless it was a mistake, like you said. Yeah, because, because the idea of breaking into a customer's home or forcibly entering a customer's home to change a dumb credit meter for a smart credit meter, I, I, I just I can't think of how that would ever would ever occur. The other, the other number, just in terms of the, the number of, we, we installed just under 100,000 prepayment meters last year. More than 70,000 were voluntary at the request of customers. So when you look in total, we've got 20,000 installed under warrant. We've got 6,000 business-driven mode change, which we're no longer doing. And another 70,000 that were installed at the request of customers. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, if I might just check. At the request of customers, I, I used to work in a business where I had to read customer order journeys for call centres 
and uh, often it was the advice of the company agents to the customer. So uh, can I just be clear, when you say at the request of the customer, what that actually means, I think, is that the British Gas call centre person has called somebody and said, we need to sort out your ability to pay your bills. We recommend you move on to a prepayment meter. Is that right? <coughs> no, because you could have lots of landlords who want to have a prepayment so somebody will buy a buy-to-let property. and they want The majority of people are domestic customers that are paying their own bills, though, aren't they? I mean, do you really have the data that suggests how many customers ring, up, ring you up and say, please move me to a prepayment meter that costs more to run and which will disconnect the electricity from my house? I'm sorry, the prepayment meter doesn't cost more to run. The prepayment, electricity under the prepayment meter is the cheapest electricity on the market today. <laughs> Gas is slightly more expensive, um, but, they, but it's, it's a misconception that there's a premium on uh, a large premium on this. So gas is a bit more expensive. But electricity, the cheapest electricity you buy in the market today is under a prepayment meter. Oh, but you've not answered my question. How many customers practically call you up and ask without the advice of your call centre agents to be moved on to a prepayment meter? I, I don't meter? have that number down. I that suspect I that's probably close to zero, isn't it? Most people would rather just stay on a... Well, on, on the... Um, again, your assertion that the majority are owner-occupiers, I'm not sure is borne out by the data. Um, of the 20,000 prepayment meters that we installed, um, more than 4,000 were in vacant properties. Um, we do have people that will, a buy-to-let landlord will tend, in my experience, to prefer to have a prepayment meter. So if there's a property purchased, they want a prepayment meter because they don't want to be liable for that. But I don't have the numbers to hand, but I just thought it was important. That I just wanted to clarify your language because I'm not, I'm not sure I, I, I fully buy it, but I'm sorry to interrupt, Mark. All right, you give me a segue into another uh, sort of follow-up question from, from earlier before I get into what I really want to ask. Um, and, and we, you talked about 1.2 million um, prepayment yeah, customers, Mr. Shea, some, a large majority of which I think you said were voluntary. And Mr. Bullen talked about uh, switching between credit and prepayment um, yeah. quite regularly, I think. Now, some years ago, more years ago than I care to uh, remember, and before your time, certainly, Mr. Shea, I was a moved into a house that wasn't a new house to us, but had been let and had prepayment meters, um, and was with British Gas, who then wanted, from a young couple who were in full-time um, employment with uh, credit, uh, good credit rating, wanted £800 to take out prepayment meters and move on to credit, which another supplier had done uh, at no charge. Um, how easy is it for customers to move from prepayment into credit? I mean, given that was probably 20 years ago. I mean, it's, if customers pass the credit check, then as long as we think customers can afford to pay, then uh, it's, it's no problem at all. Now, I, I, I don't have any knowledge of the, the £800 charge. I mean, I think practices were quite different uh, yeah, all yeah. that time ago. But, you know, I mean, ultimately, it, what, what we want is something where the customer can pay. Because whilst it's really difficult for um, customers going on to prepayment meters, it's also a significant contributor to mental ill health, people running up debts that they can't pay. So this is an incredibly difficult situation. Prepayment meters are currently um, very much in, in the press, in the, in the media, and there's a general perception, I think, that, they're, um, that, that they're, they're really not the right thing to have. But 20 years ago, when I was at school, I remember people being disconnected. The installation of prepayment meters, as distasteful as some people might find it, has reduced substantially the number of people that used to just get cut off and be left with no gas and electricity. Thank you. Sorry, I'll, um, I'll get on to what I was, uh, <laughs> was going to ask initially. So Citizens Advice conducted some internal case analysis they found that 86% of customers moved to prepayment were in contact with the supplier. Is the use of prepayment meters as a means to recover debt really used as a last resort? I'll start with Mr O'Shea. It is absolutely for us, yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, what steps are taken to support customers that are in payment difficulty before we move them to a prepayment? Uh, and, what, so, and what sort of level of debt would we consider? Um, so we would try and contact the customer. We would look to agree payment plans. Our payment plans will go up to five years. Um, the average level of debt for a customer that goes on to prepayment meter is just over £1,000. Uh, sorry, goes on to prepayment meter um, under a, uh, an installation under warrant is just over £1,000. Mr Bullen, do you? Well, similarly. Most of your customers are already on 
Yeah, a lot of our customers are already on um, prepay, but obviously you know, the key thing to remember is this is a demographic issue, and they are, it's mostly in rented accommodation, and there's a lot of change of tenancy happening all the time. So 25% of my customers move every year. So um, circumstances in any particular household <coughs> can change, do change very regularly. Um, but yeah, we switch people to credit mode um, every week. Is there a minimum level of debt where you would... I think our process kicks in after about three months. So, um, but I think generally, because our customers are relatively newer, we don't have the, um, quite the same levels of debt as British Gas. We try to capture the process, capture the issue, a lot earlier on. Um, and as uh, British Gas just said, you know, switching people to prepay often actually saves them money as well. So it helps them to cut their debt going forward. <coughs> yeah, Mr. Shea, the Times investigation that we've talked about at length revealed. Uh, warrants pursued for customers with vulnerabilities such as mental health disorders, physical disabilities, children with asthma. That same internal case analysis by citizens advice found 85% of people using a prepayment meter would meet Ofgem's definition of vulnerability. What steps do you take to identify vulnerability and, and assess whether it's safe and practicable to move to prepayment? So obviously we have to have contact with the customer so um and our definition of vulnerability would be somebody that has children under five years old somebody that's somebody over the age of 85 um uh, cognitive impairment such as dementia but but often that can be established through contact with the customer understand but if we have no contact with the customer it's 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 impossible to establish that now i think there might be an opportunity for us to have something that is <coughs> Cross industry, but actually goes beyond just the energy industry to understand, have a common definition amongst uh, service providers as to what vulnerability is, and to have a central register that would make it far easier. That means that we would know as long as the voters' role was kept up to date, we would we would know. But if we can't contact a customer, then that's why we then have our VATO involved. They go to the door. If the customer doesn't answer the door, there's only so much that we can do. I'm right in thinking that there is some link to DWP for warm. Homes yes. scheme. That's right. Yes. So that there's potentially something that could be done around. I think there's. I absolutely think that there is a lot that could be done around this. It just requires. But I think it has to go beyond the energy industry. I think it should uh, go uh, to other essential service providers as well, because what that would do is it would mean that we would have something. I mean, nothing's ever foolproof, but we would have something that was more satisfactory than relying on actually having contact with with the customer. Okay. Uh, that same investigation found British Gas agents continue to remotely switch customers, as we just discussed, from uh, from credit to to prepayment, uh, despite Centrica publicly stating that it would be stopped. Is that still ongoing? No, no. And, and look, I, I was there was a question earlier on to the um, the person from Arvato um, about my my comments. She was absolutely. My comments were about the behaviour that I observed in some of the videos. The language used about being excited about um, forced entry into home, and the second one was the uh, the remote mode, mode switch rather than try to go to the home. We had a warrant, so we, we we had the right to do that. But we made a very public statement because of our concerns around uh, some of the issues with regard to prepayment meters. We made a very public statement just the week before that. Now, you'll ask if I made a statement then. And somebody that how can I tell you now it's not been done? All I can tell you is we've reinforced the fact that that should not be done. Okay. Um, and finally, from me, how many customers contacted you to complain that they'd been moved when it was not safe for them? Uh, and what happens with that information? What do you do with that information? Since the Times report, we've had around 300 customers that have uh, written to us to say that they feel they've been moved uh, incorrectly. We're looking into every one of those cases. If that's the case, then we'll reverse it. We'll make it right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're horribly behind time, but uh, Ian Lavery. Hi. Um... The six-week pause in the prepayment meter fittings and remote switching comes to an end, I think, in probably days' time, at the end of March. Uh, what's your intention at the end of that period? Are you going to revert the type or change the policy? So, so firstly, what we've got to do is to understand, before we in British Gas would think about restarting this practice, we've got to understand whether there's a s systemic issue in our processes. So we would not restart that until an investigation is done. Our investigation won't be done until, I think, the end of April. So we would not restart. Um, Ofgem also have their investigation, and we're under a moratorium from Ofgem as well. So that won't restart for us at the end of March. 
But, but what I really want is for us to figure out, th this goes beyond the energy industry, what do we do to help people that cannot pay their bills? This is not something that can be solved by Centrica or by any energy company. The question is, how do we want to treat people that can't afford to pay for their heating, can't afford to pay for their food, can't afford to pay for their rent, can't afford to pay their mortgage? And, and I think that requires something from industry, regulators, government, um, Citizens Advice Bureau, other um, consumer groups, to come to an, an agreement. How do we fix that? Now, unfortunately, that's going to take time. But for us in Centrica, we won't restart unless we're sure there are no systemic issues in our process. You, you mentioned um, the, the, the issues here about vulnerable people. What engagement are you had with the government about a, basically a social type tariff, a social discount sort of tariff for those people whom you mentioned who are finding it very difficult to, to survive? Well, we've had ongoing conversations and I spoke to the Energy Minister just after this story um, uh, broke in the media to discuss what we were doing, what's the immediate point and then what could the solution be in the longer term. And, and I think, I wasn't a fan of social tariffs at first when I, when I took this job, but the more I look into it, the more I understand about uh, some of our con uh, the consumer, the more I think this could make perfect sense. Now, it could be in a number of different uh, guises. One is a social tariff, could be something whereby um, you're, it's, it's means tested effectively, <laughs> and the, um, either a settlement mechanism between energy companies, so those that can afford it pay more and those that can't pay less, and there's a settlement mechanism or something that's administered by the DWP. Some of the conversations I also had around the universal support that was given for consumers, and which was brought out last year, whilst the support from government was very, um, very positively received, I lobbied quite hard to have that um, be more targeted support because it, it gives support to people that don't need it. And if we were to take that support away, we could give more to those that, that desperately need it. So, so those are the, the two main areas of conversation I've had. But I would be supportive of something that comes in. I think it should be funded from general taxation rather than from energy consumers because that's more progressive. Uh, but that will require um, uh, quite some quite some discussion. Mr. Bullen. Um, well, equally, you know, this is a subject we, we've looked at a lot. Look, fundamentally, what we have here is an affordability problem, and people in those lower couple of deciles of income their incomes have not gone up anywhere like the rate of inflation that applies to them. So fuel and food, which is the things that have been driving inflation, a disproportionate amount of their expenditure. So you know, clearly what we need is to address that income issue. And I think the best way to go about that is through some kind of social discount on energy bills, because it's obviously better for that customer that money goes you know, directly to where it's needed, in other words, keeping their house warm or keeping the lights on. I think you know, the experience that we've had through the EBS scheme going through this winter has been you know, phenomenally enlightening as to the impact that that can have. But you know, clearly we need um, some kind of social discount um, to help customers through this affordability problem. And I, you know, I don't think this is something that's going to go away. I think there's a long-term requirement, and it is bigger than the current warm home discount. Um, but it does come down to better targeting so that the cost of it can be managed. And um, yeah, it, it, there needs to be a long run um, solution to this problem because it's not about to go away. You know, when vulnerable people just simply cannot afford to pay their gas and electricity bills, who should pay? I think it goes beyond just gas and electricity. Um, it oh, well, that's, I mean, that's what this no, discussion no, is about. I, no, I understand, but I, think, but I think what's really important is that what we find with our customers, our customers are amazing people, and they try to pay. And if they can't pay their gas and electricity bill, they're also not able to pay for their food. They're not able to pay for their rent. They can't pay their council tax. Now, we could say that energy companies could, could absorb it, I believe that Centrica British Gas is the only energy retailer in the UK that's making a profit. Most other companies are making a loss. Half the market has gone bust in the past year, in the past 18 months. So there is a market where there is very little profit in energy retail to subsidise those that can't pay. I would also say that the vulnerability definitions that we've got just now don't take into account financial vulnerability. That is a huge gap. It talks about mental health, it doesn't talk about financial vulnerability. I think that the way that we should pay for this, a progressive way, is to pay for it through general taxation. Mr. Bullen, you, you, you seem to shirk there when uh, 
Was that where she has suggested the, the profit margins and, and no. losses by certain companies? I think we're both sitting here in our role as the head of a licensed energy supplier. Licensed energy suppliers are not making profits. I know some energy companies are making profits, <laughs> but not in the business of supplying customers. I think a figure that was quoted by Energy UK um, a few weeks ago was something like minus 2% is the profit margin. In other words, everybody's making a loss. So somehow, if, if vulnerable customers can't afford to pay, that cost clearly does have to be socialised because licensed energy companies do not have that money. Um, and it would have to come from either from other energy consumers or from taxpayers, you know, pretty much the same group of people, one way or another. It has to come from somewhere else because energy companies, licensed energy suppliers, don't have this money, and it's not allowed for in any of the price gaps. So if, 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 I'm, if I may add, at the moment, technically what happens is it's been socialised across society, so it's, it's regressive because there's an element of the price cap which deals with bad debts. And so those who don't pay, not, not in prepay, no, but, but those who don't pay, um, that's socialised, and it's, essentially it's added to the bill of everybody else. And so it might sound a bit rich for me as the chief executive of an energy company to say it should be the general taxpayer, but at the moment, those that are struggling but able to pay their bill are paying for those that are either unable or unwilling to pay their bill. And, and I just think that like the cost of failures of other, other energy companies, that, that's just not right um, because it's highly, highly regressive. Okay. okay, I'm sorry that we've timed out. I think we could go on, but we, we really must get off Gem uh, in before we have to finish today. So thank you uh, to both of you. Just lastly, Mr. O'Shea, you've referenced a lot the internal investigation and you've been unable to tell us whether wrongdoing has happened or not subject to that investigation. Will you share a copy of that with us when it's ready? Very, very happy to, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you. Um, we're now <coughs> going to do a very quick turnaround, if possible, please, uh, to our next witnesses, uh, where we'll be welcoming Jonathan Braley, the Chief Executive of the Energy Regulator Ofgem, uh, Neil Lawrence, who is the Director of Retail at Ofgem, and Catherine Scott, who is the Director of Enforcement and Emerging Issues uh, at Ofgem. Uh, so we'll just get you comfortably uh, sat, and there should be some new cups and water for you. Thank you. Um, I'm always conscious that we have you on last, and that means that you get less time uh, with us, and I don't want you to feel left out. So we're going to try and make a quick bit of progress. Uh, right, Mr. Brilly, just to come to you straight away, the thing that I'm troubled with after the evidence today is, on the one hand, we have this Times expose, which so, shows completely egregious examples <laughs> of forcible entry into pe vulnerable people's homes to forcibly install prepayment meters, which will end up turning off their electricity and gas because they can't afford to pay their bills. We have the Bayless of Arto saying they were just doing what British Gas or their energy suppliers told them to do. And then we had British Gas and the energy suppliers telling us that they don't know whether something's gone wrong or not. They're doing an investigation and they were sorry to see it happen. It looks to me like everyone's either blaming each other or just trying not to be kind of uh, upfront about this, what seems to me to be a very clear breach of the license conditions. Uh, what's your initial view on that? So, look, we are deeply concerned about not only the reports in the Times, the reports that have been appearing for some time around the behaviour of energy companies with regards to the forced installation of prepayment meters. Now, to step back from this, we are working through one of the biggest gas crises we've had in living memory. And so families are under financial pressure that has not been experienced within the energy system in my memory. We are seeing people, even with government support that is paying almost a third of our bills, <coughs> seeing the bills rising by 250% roughly compared to where they were a year and a half ago. Now, we have been clear throughout the last year the sector's focus needs to be on its most vulnerable customers. The reason we launched market compliance reviews, and I'm sure we'll come to how we thought about British Gas in a moment, but the reason we launched those market compliance reviews is because our message was really simple. If we are going to have a successful and profitable energy industry, then they need to look after their vulnerable customers. Now, we think our rules are clear. There is a lot of judgment when you think about whether or not it is safe and practicable to put a prepayment meter in someone's home, but we think that the principles are clear. We, look, we wrote to the suppliers in November to make sure they were clear on our rules, and we launched a further compliance review in January that's going to look precisely at the systems and processes and outcomes for customers who have had these prepayment meters installed. Now, alongside that, we are checking to see if we need to tighten those rules, and we are working with the industry and consumer groups on a new code of practice, and we expect that to be in place with broad support by the end of March. 
But I need to be clear with this committee, our priority is in making sure this industry gets its act in order. Therefore, they will not be restarting forced installation of prepayment meters at the end of March, and only when and if they can establish they are acting in accordance with that new code of practice. So we are deeply concerned about this. We have investigations and compliance reviews ongoing, but you know, my message to Chris and to all of the industry is you need to fix things now. You don't need to wait for our reviews to conclude. Um, uh, that's very welcome. Uh, but in 2018, uh, admittedly before you were running Ofgem, uh, Ofgem took action about this issue. I've got the copy of the notice from 2018. And in it, it says, Ofgem will take tough action if the suppliers fail to treat their vulnerable customers in the right way. Is this not symptomatic of the comments from Energy UK last time? that the energy suppliers look at Ofgem and just think, you're not really going to enforce the rules so we can do what we like? Well, look, um, you know that following the reviews we had of Xero, we have completely changed the way we do compliance. So in the past, in 2018, 2019, we relied on complaints, we resolved <coughs> complaints, and we did it pretty reactively. The compliance reviews we launched this year were proactively looking across the sector and its behaviour, and we're responding to those. And they have made big changes, which I'm happy to come to. Now, now, equally, you know, those aren't going to be all the answer. We always rely on others, including complaints and including whistleblowers, to, me to make us aware of what's happening. And that's what happened in the case of British Gas. The reason why we suspended activity after the Times investigation was in part some of the cases you've raised, but also the behaviour of the operatives involved. We don't just have licence conditions on the forced installation of prepayment metres. We are very clear vulnerable customers need to be treated fairly and that means vulnerable customers need to be treated with respect. Thank you. Uh, just coming to the market compliance review, because it, I mean, it, it is slightly, uh, it's more than slightly concerning, quite frankly, that you did a review of the energy suppliers and how they dealt with their vulnerable customers, and British Gas <coughs> came out as the exemplar in the industry, and if the Times stories are all correct, how can that possibly be the best of all the energy suppliers? How did that market compliance review go so wrong? Well, look, um, when we did the vulnerability compliance review, there were two, one on ability to pay and one on vulnerability. We did identify weaknesses in British Gas. We did identify weaknesses particularly around their relationship with their third parties. Throughout that process, we heard complaints around the forced installation of prepayment meters, and that's why we're looking more closely at it now. But clearly, the picture we have from British Gas and the behavior of Avato simply don't match. So that's why we've launched the investigation, and that's why we'll unearth what's happened. But to be clear, Chair, the, those compliance reviews identified a huge number of issues the industry needs to deal with. I was saying publicly in November that the industry needs to up its game on the way it treats vulnerable customers. And indeed, the way we have customer service in general. So, for example, 900,000 direct debits have had to be reassessed to make sure they're set at the right level. We have made sure across the piece that companies are better at identifying vulnerable customers making sure that fits these processes, but also they are put on the priority services register. We have also made sure that suppliers give additional credit. So when prepayment meters are at the point <coughs> where they, they, they self-disconnect, they should be offered extra credit by their suppliers. And I know Bill complains about the result, but Utilita weren't doing that. They accepted that, and that's why they paid around £850,000 in redress. Now, we, we, I can continue with the examples that we have, but I need to let the suppliers understand one thing. You know, if we go back to Storm Arwen last year and the behaviour of the networks, it cost them £10 million because they were not proactive enough and they were not protecting their vulnerable customers. If we find, through this compliance review, or indeed if we find in general suppliers don't up their game, then those fines will be levied here. Now, Chris is right. The sector is in recovery from a massive gas crisis over the last two years. But it would be a shame if a sector that does need to return to reasonable profitability is stopped doing so by Ofgem's enforcement action because we are forced to demonstrate to companies it will cost them more if they don't follow the rules. Thank you. And in the latest market compliance review, I can see you, you are examining a number of issues, including internal processes and controls, the flow of management information. Um, were you concerned by the answers that we heard earlier, how, and this was just yeah. British Gas's example, but they were the witness, that the Audit and Risk Committee, the board, didn't seem to be getting the information about the alleged <laughs> breaches of the licence conditions. Surely there's a problem about the corporate governance of these suppliers, isn't there? Well, Neil may want to kick in. 
Yeah, yeah so just, just to reiterate, we do ask um, uh, suppliers for their assurance records when we do market compliance reviews, and we will ask for any assurance records through this, as well as doing the substantive testing. We think it's really important that we understand how companies are set up at the top half, but also the experiences of customers are receiving on the ground, because clearly there's been a mismatch here from the previous review, as Jonathan aligned to. You'll look at the papers that have gone to the Audit and Risk Committee and you'll be able to see yourselves whether this issue has been raised or not. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and just the very last thing for me, can we please change the language? It is not self-disconnection. It's not someone actively choosing to turn off their electricity or gas. It's that they're not able to pay the bill <coughs> and the supplier turns it off. If we can change just one simple thing in the changes ahead, I think we need to change the language around self-disconnection. I think that's absolutely right. Thank you. Bim Afalami, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Brearley, did anybody warn you, or rather anybody who works for you in Ofgem, that maybe with British Gas there was a problem? So before, we, sorry, before any public um, press reports or anything came out. So we had extensive conversation with consumer groups who were warning us about behaviour across the industry, actually not necessarily targeted on British Gas. And in fact, you know, before I came in front of this committee last time. We spent time with both the companies and with the consumer groups to identify what the issue was, and that led to the compliance review, because that's how we understand and get the evidence around behaviour, but also led to us to look again at the code of practice to make sure companies are clear on the rules. Now, I'm not pretending that these are simple judgments. Trying to understand the vulnerability of a family who may not want to talk to you is complex, but it's the supplier's responsibility to deliver against that. So, one of the... Um, and I appreciate it's pot calling kettle black when we say we talk about a lot of reviews. You know, politicians like reviews as much as off chem. Um, you have often said, look, you've seen evidence, you've heard things, and then you do a review, and that gets to the heart of the problem. And not just in this area, you can name lots of other areas, I'm sure. Do you think, as a process, that's really adequate? I mean, to what extent, my question for you is, to what extent are you monitoring real-time information and data. So you don't need a review. You can stamp things out where they go wrong. So look, we do have data monitoring. And again, Neil can expand on that. But what we're looking here to, to establish the evidence of what's happened <coughs> is to look at the way in which companies have behaved, the way in which they've have treated customers, and indeed the way in which their offices have treated customers. Now, you can't do that without an extensive process that looks at the behaviours involved. Last week, we launched a partnership with Citizens Advice to make sure that we're not just getting the company's paperwork around this, and it comes back to the questions in the previous session, we are going to hear directly from customers and customer experiences. That does take time. Right. Yeah, just, and just to add to what Jonathan said, yeah, absolutely, we are improving our monitoring functions. What, uh, what currently are the monitoring functions? So we receive a range of uh, reports on a monthly and quarterly basis from suppliers across the market, <laughs> that's domestic and B2B, and we use that to make our risk assessment of where things are going wrong. We match that with reports that we get from the consumer and charity groups who meet with them on a monthly basis, and they report issues to us. We get some whistleblowing. And in addition to that, we do do some monitoring of social media to really get an understanding of what's going on in the market. We recognise that that's a journey. We've changed our operating model in Ofgem to move to a professions-based model to invest in those resources and the different capabilities, such as digital, to make those processes easier so we can get to the heart of the model. And the compliance change of approach, the compliance enforcement strategy of going to market compliance reviews is proactive. So we're looking at those and saying, look, across the market now, we're identifying things that we want more information on, and we're challenging the suppliers to up their game. And if we continue to do that process, we may need to go in more in depth, appreciating you know, it may need more sample testing, more substantive testing, it may be more invasive, but we get to the end of that process, we hope to improve the standards right the way across the industry. Because I mean, industry if, if that process works well, you won't actually need to be <coughs> asking the suppliers constantly for these reports. You should just know things, and that should make everybody's life a lot easier. Just, I suppose, one last question. To what I was very struck, Mr. Brearley, by your comment about effectively most people in this industry aren't making money in the retail market. And obviously there's been a price shock and we're not unite, unique to that in the United Kingdom. It's happening all over Europe. How do you see us getting to an equilibrium where we have businesses that make a reasonable profit at the same time as fewer people being forced into the terrible situations that we've heard about today 
over the last couple of hours. How, now, I don't, I'm not asking about the process of getting there, right. but actually, what does that world look like? So look, I've, I've said to our board, there are three things we need to do with the retail sector. So first of all, as you say, is return it to reasonable profitability. We cannot create companies without sufficient investment behind them. Second is to move them to a more financially resilient place, certainly than they were a year ago, and we have made a great deal of progress doing that. But neither of those two things could or should happen without service standards improving. And I go a bit further than, than simply talking about vulnerable customers. We think service standards need to increase across the board. Let me give you one example of our compliance reviews last year. So E.ON, 50% of calls are dropped before they're answered. Now, if you're a vulnerable customer, how do you tell your company you're vulnerable if you can't get through on the phone? So my view is those three things go together. The deal with the industry is we will continue to amend the price cap and we have made significant changes to the way it works. We will be monitoring and maintaining financial resilience, but the industry as a whole needs to improve its standards. And last question, Chair, if I may. Which regulatory changes, if any, are required to get to that world that you have just outlined? So I think the compliance reviews we have, the way in which we proactively check across the sector, should drive up standards. I am interested, coming back to your previous question, about whether there are some automatic ways you can build in financial incentives for, for good service standards. <coughs> um, but it's my belief that by doing that and by continuing to run these reviews, they're not one-off, they should be over time. And as you say, a company with real data, we will be able to move the sector to an equilibrium that I think works for everyone. But to do that, we do need the suppliers to take this seriously. The other thing I would say, though, and you've heard me say this publicly before, behind this problem is a huge problem of affordability right now. Now, the government have put huge amounts of support over the last six months. You know, we were talking in, in August of prices that might be five or six thousand pounds right now. But the simple fact is, if you are low income, if you are a high energy user, if you have a child with disability who relies on electricity for, for their equipment, or you live in a drafty social housing home, your energy bill is extremely difficult to afford. Now, if we don't tackle that together, then it's very hard to create the rules and the system around it that's going to get to that place that you're describing. And that's why we are keen to work with government on a social tariff or something else that will address that problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just very quickly, uh, Neil Lawrence, can I just check I understood your answer uh, to Bima Falami correctly about the compliance reviews. I think what you were acknowledging was that you're moving from a process where you were looking originally at processes, i.e. what is the flow of decision making in the business, what are your policy documents and kind of ticking the boxes, to looking more at outcomes with customer engagement. So that was an acknowledgement, I think, that previously in your market compliance reviews, you weren't that focused on outcomes. Is that right? So uh, we were focused on outcomes in some of the compliance reviews. So as I said, the direct debit review um, clear, clearly made some, some substantial improvements for, for, for outcomes. But we recognise the process is new. We're evolving the process. Uh, we're doing more work in this compliance review on prepayment to look at those consumer outcomes. Absolutely, we support the use of the consumer line with, um, with systems advice. We may use that again on future reviews into anything else to collect that information and data as we evolve the process give us better confidence in what the suppliers are ultimately doing to protect consumers. Can I just, just say one thing, Chair, just before, we, before we move on? One thing I, I need to be open and honest with this committee about is, is with all of this compliance work, even if it is perfect and we accept it's an evolving sort of process, we are not going to capture everything that happens within companies. So there will always be behaviours and incidences that are outside of our ability to look at those. <coughs> and that's why we need to maintain a reactive as well as a proactive function. Thank you. I've got a quick supplementary from... Very briefly, Andrew. Chair, thank you. You said 50% of the calls are dropped. So that's mm. people who are trying to contact and unfortunately give up in the end. Yes. Could you tell me whether those calls are premium rate or free? Uh, um, I'll need to confirm, though. I, uh, my understanding is that, um, that, that they may well be free, but we'll write back to you and confirm that because I can't answer for certain. I think I'm right in saying that the, those calls are zero, zero 0808 numbers, so they are free. But well, that's only from a landline, is my information. Could you? Well, we'll come back to you and give you that information. Grateful. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Alan Brown. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, do you agree with Sutton's advice that moving customers to prepayment meters is just a way suppliers to disconnect <coughs> them without breaking the rules? So I don't accept 
that is necessarily what's happening. I've spoken to a lot of customers on prepayment meters. In fact, I've spoken to a lot of customers who are struggling to pay their bills, who prefer it as a payment method. Just to clarify things, if you look at a dual full bill right now today, it is slightly more expensive. It is, well, it's more expensive than it is for direct debit, for example. And I expect this committee have seen the reports in the press about what may happen tomorrow. Um, but customers still prefer it because it gives them direct control. So not everybody, but some customers choose it because they say. Any customers me, you talk to, you say you speak to customers. So I, I've, I've, sp I've spoken to double-figure customers who have said to me they prefer this system. I'm not saying that's right for everybody, but I think there is an important point here that for some customers, particularly if this is smart prepay, which is something we should talk about here. Um, they prefer to have this system because it allows them to say, I'm going to allocate this much of my energy this week or this month. For some people, that is really, really important. It's very hard to do that with a credit. Which bill. checks do Ofgem make or have companies make that once people are forced onto a prepayment meter, that they're not, that, that, you know, they're not actually then effectively cut off, they're still able to access heating and able to, um, to heat their homes? We have rules that say suppliers need to be proactive about people who do get, off, get cut off when their credit runs out. And so they need to respond. Now, the rules around that are they need to offer additional credit to customers when that situation occurs. Now, that is limited. That can't be unending. But cut suppliers should be proactively contacting their customers. What does that look like? That's a proactive approach. So what should companies be doing when somebody's in a prepayment meter and they've hurt that because it's £10 and and then if they don't put money back in, the so, Let me give you kind of a pen portrait. You have someone on smart meter. They, you can see that they have been disconnected because they haven't been put the credit on that allows them to use the energy they need. <coughs> you should be contacting them. You should be proactively, in my mind, trying to link them with charities and debt advice to make sure they can begin to find ways to manage their bills. I've seen suppliers, good suppliers, actually sit down with that customer, look at their energy use and say, well, what can we do differently to reduce the bill? And you should be offering them additional support credit, so some extra credit to help them manage until, for example, your benefits get repaid or your monthly pay comes in. And so those are things we should, we should be doing. And you're monitoring things. the companies, are you making sure that all these checks have been undertaken? Well, that's been, I mean, Neil may want to comment on this, but that is part of the compliance processes we have. Yeah, and we do get the data on, um, uh, on, uh, on customers who disconnect themselves. We are monitoring some of that information. Later this year, we may look at those issues in more depth, in line with our um, our plans around market compliance reviews. But may we look, have, but we have I mean, that, to consume. With prepaid for yeah. people on prepayment meters is the big topic of the day, and obviously more and more people are getting forced onto prepayment meters. And you only may I'll review this further. Just to expand on where we've got to on the code of practice, so we started that discussion first of all, thinking it was a conversation about who this should apply to. Actually, there are three areas where we are going to reset expectations. And as I say, the industry won't start until we're confident they're being met. First is absolutely around how you interpret safe and practicable. So, so which households could this or should this apply to? Second category is how, which will define much more clearly the sorts of teams you have in place when they go to install prepayment meters. But the third category, which I think you're alluding to, is what happens afterwards. What is the aftercare? Now, if you imagine you have a vulnerable family in extremely difficult circumstances who have a prepayment meter for the first time, we want to make sure there is an entire care package around that family that focuses on their needs. And just to say critical to that, and something that we are pushing as far as we can with the existing law, is the use of a smart prepayment meter. So it is much more effective and much more efficient and much easier for a company to offer support when smart prepay is installed compared to traditional meters. Can I just add something, if I can, Major, but Jonathan? So, uh, uh, into your question, um, what we want the suppliers to do is do those checks because they're in the license conditions anyway. It shouldn't take Ofgem to come along to change the behaviour. So, well, you know, while we will do these checks, we will do these compliance reviews, ultimately the suppliers are responsible for those license conditions and we're asking them to act now. Has there been any concerns about whether that's happening or not? Because you, you've said you've already, you'd already challenged the suppliers to up their game before, so... Is that an area that you've been challenging them to up their game to make sure, with the increase in prepayment meters, that people are actually able to access energy and they're not just getting cut off? So we'll, we continue to engage with suppliers on the way they look after vulnerable customers as a whole, including that. But look, the, the things you should be doing as a supplier to identify vulnerabilities, to make sure people don't get to that point where you have that crisis point where a prepayment meter is being installed. There are a whole set of things they should be doing. 
So you need to identify customers' vulnerabilities, you need to identify when they're struggling to pay, you need to try to get them an affordable repayment plan, you need to try to make sure they have access to help and advice, and you need to try and help them manage their energy use. We expect suppliers to do a whole set of things around that, and those are the sorts of things we monitor. But coming back to Neil's point, you know, it should not take the regulator to check every single detail of every single supplier all the time. The suppliers should be doing this automatically. And if they're not, we are going to have to send a very strong signal, and there is only one way to do that, and that is to issue fines. I was just going to say, we, we did that, I think Jonathan alluded to it already. Um, last year, we made a couple of orders against uh, companies who weren't complying with those rules, who weren't offering additional support credit. What was the outcome of the orders? Well, uh, in, in that case, um, they changed their policies and processes and they paid compensation to customers and a payment to our address fund of about £850,000. Just quick last, Jonathan, you, you alluded to standard charges, so who's, who's pushed for a change in unfair, higher <coughs> standard charges that were applied to prepayment meters? We are examining all of the costs around prepayment meters. We are looking at ways to... I've asked you about it before. So is obviously I'm driving this? Or is so it coming from government? Or is it so, so we are driving this. Now, clearly there have been reports um, about what government may do in the interim. The problem we have is, you know, the, the way in which we will find to equalise the cost of prepayment meters versus direct debit, for example, will be around looking at the underlying cost structure. And the problem with that, and, and I know this is a... It's a frustrating answer for me, this. You have to go through the industry governance processes that we have, but we hope that there will be a way of bridging that and delivering something quite quickly. Social tariff, um, what engagement since last gave evidence, what engagement you had with government and a potential so social tariff? So we have a lot of engagement with government on pricing regulation in general, including a social tariff, but I, I sit here before you the same as last time, saying this is fundamental to getting at the heart of the underlying problem, which is the affordability right now for many families. Do you think social tariff is a good way to go? So my view is, you, I think I've gone as far as I can as a regulator. I think we should explore it. I think it is a good option. We need that or something else, but really it's up to the politicians. Thank you, if that's okay, Alan. Sorry, thank you. Uh, lastly, Sir Bob Neil, please. Mr Brady, just a couple of things, please. The existing law in relation to the granting of warrants um, very heavily depends upon the court with virtually no discretion, um, accepting the accuracy of that which is said by the energy supplier or their agents. Is that a satisfactory state of affairs? So, um, I, think, I think, as you're aware, that you know, it is difficult for a regulator yeah. to comment on the courts in general. But let, yeah, me, yes. put it, but let me put it this way. Um, from afar, and without offering advice or influence to the courts, it, it seems to me the role of the courts is not clear. And I think it would help all of us mm. if that were clarified in law. Now, the, the new department, the energy department, plus mm. the Ministry of Justice, have to prioritise what they do. And there's a whole set of things that people like us are bidding for in the Energy Act, the new Energy, Act, the new energy Bill that's in the House already. But in my mind, it would be helpful if that were clarified. The 1954 Act is very old. It uh, is. And, uh, and very unqualified. So yes. you know, it's very clear. So and the final thing is, in terms of that ensuring the quality, the accuracy of the information that's given to the courts, let many of us think you're right, let's look again at the 54 Act and the tests. Uh, would you regard it as something where, as regulator, you would uh, want to take action against a supplier who did not ensure, um, or didn't have, have adequate systems in place to ensure that they or their agents provided <coughs> accurate and reliable information to the courts under the existing law? So, look, I mean, I think we, we have our set of rules and regulations around yeah. this. We have compliance processes around this. Mm. I, we would need to consider with the courts what the appropriate role for the is. The, the only thing mm. I highlight is getting in between someone, you know, in effect, a witness in, a, in court yeah. and, and a judge is a complex issue, but we'd be happy to look at it. But it's, it's clearly an issue, isn't it? Where it is, absolutely. And I think, you know, I'd start from the basics. What are the courts expected to establish? Yeah. And then on that basis, what's the best way of establishing it? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And just very lastly, uh, in response to the Times story, I think uh, Ofgem instructed suppliers to start to review the forced installation of prepayment meters in households uh, and see whether they needed to be reversed and compensated. Are you actively monitoring those uh, reviews and have people already started to have them removed and being compensated? So suppliers are certainly re report back to us. They are actively looking at this. We don't have figures for you yet, but as we issue the new code of practice, we will ask companies to look back at the, the prepayment meters they'd installed and then report back to us. 
And often people watching the committee, when we've shone a light on unacceptable corporate behaviour in this country, will say to us, well, what happens as a consequence? Can you just be really clear with the committee that if you find breaches of licence conditions, what is it that you're going to do about it? Well, let's just lay out the principle. The principle is you fix the problem, you compensate someone who is affected, and we have discretion around, in a, in a sense, the, the incentive effect across the industry. So in this case, I would imagine, you know, without prejudice, et cetera, et cetera, I'd imagine that means offering restitution, so often to change the meter that was installed. Some people may want to keep it, some people may want to change it. Offering compensation, and if it's systemic and widespread, then we will be fining the companies involved. Uh, thank you. So that brings us to the end of the session. I'm not sure whether it's good news or not, but I think this is probably the last time that we will interact on energy policy, <laughs> um, certainly with me and the chair, due to uh, changes that will be coming uh, to the committee in the next few weeks. So thank you to all of you for your contributions and your work with the committee over the last few years. Uh, we'll now bring the session to an end. Order, order. <laughs>